Mythos Busters, investigating the mystery, monsters, and madness of Arkham Horror, the card game. Hello and welcome to episode 8 of Mythos Busters. I'm Sean. With us tonight, we've got the crew. We've got Ian. Hey, hello. And Tom. Hello. And Nick. Hi, guys. Guys, we've got a fun episode tonight. Uh, but it's been a while since we've recorded, so I, I kind of want to take a second to catch up with y'all. I know we do tentacle time, but Ian, what's been going on? We haven't, I feel like we don't talk anymore outside of like <laughs> peripheral conversations in discord. <laughs> well, uh, so distant, Ian. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not sure sure. how to respond to that. But Ian, cuddled. this is a safe place. <laughs> uh, I thought it was a podcast recording and really it's just an intervention for something apparently. <laughs> we have to you talk need- about your LCG habit. <laughs> we need to talk about all their side projects, it turns uh, out. Y- yeah, that too. Uh, I'm good. I'm just fighting off a flu that attacked me, so uh, I apologize if you hear lots of tea sipping and, and and snorting throughout the episode. But <laughs> other than that, I've been good. Just, just, just trying to... Uh, make it through the holidays and emerge from the sea of wrapping paper that happens when you have a kid and there's just all these new toys that you have to find places for. God, and all the expectations to see people, like, they didn't give a crap before, but now that there's a kid involved, like, they expect you to be there. (laughs) (sighs) Yeah. Yeah. It's a thing. But I have been able to get a lot of gaming in, so that's good. That's good. God, I'm on the opposite end of the spectrum. I haven't been able to play a single game of Arkham in well over a week, which is remarkably weird for me. Because even when I'm at my busiest of busy, I can find an hour to sit down at my table. But, ooh, man, holidays. Tom, how about you? I know you're you're perpetually busy, but... Uh... Yeah, well, I've actually had a couple weeks off from work, which is <gasps> incredible. Is everything okay? I think, I think it's the first time this whole year, which has been awesome. But, um... Yeah, is no, your mind doing that thing where after you play a game of Guitar Hero where your eyes just keep going with the, <laughs> with the track that was you just moving? just keep seeing the nose coming at you, yeah, um, <laughs> more or less. But no, I spent some time with uh, my family um, over the holidays, which is great. So Christmas spent Christmas with them. Um, we went golfing, and I haven't been golfing in a long time, but they had these uh, golf boards, these electronic golf boards that you could ride on. As like a substitute for the golf cart. Oh yeah, you and posted that. I remember seeing that. It was that. incredible. <laughs> Uh, Remember the old days when we just used to walk? Yeah. No, it was amazing. I highly recommend anyone <laughs> try it. But as far as gaming goes, I again, I since I've been with my family, none of them are are um, board and card gamers, so I really didn't get a chance to play anything. We did play uh, a game called Joking Hazard mm. by the guys oh, from Joking Hazard Happy, Happiness. <laughs> yeah, and it's like uh, it was pretty good. It's, it's like got, you know, it's the Cards good, Against Humanity cards against formula, humanity. Yeah. but it's pretty funny. Yeah, so we had a good time playing that. I feel like there's way more room for actual creativity in that yes. one. Like there is the occasional and my biggest problem with cards against humanity is there are just cards that just win. Yeah. Like when yeah. you play jerking specific- off into a pool of children's tears, you just <laughs> win that round with, with most groups. Each like each twisted. sorry, each uh group has their like trump card, yeah, that's for sure. Yes, mm-hmm. exactly. But I feel like uh joking hazard it, 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 there's just room. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that they yeah. realized that there was uh, potential there for a party game like that when they did their random comic generator a couple years ago, and like I stopped even reading the cyanide and happiness stuff because I'm like this random comic generator is all I need. It was it was everything was golden <laughs> and they were all completely random. I loved it, so I can see how this one would be an entertaining variant on the Cards Against Humanity style. Yeah, <laughs> Nick, what have you been up to? Um, gaming wise. You know- Besides emailing me looking for feedback on games that I'm unable to provide at this point. <laughs> well, that's that's all the time, regardless of, of what time of year. But, <laughs> this is true. Um, Gaming-wise, I, I haven't played Arkham in a couple weeks. Uh, every time I approach my wife and I'm like, eh, do you want to play? Because we haven't touched Curse the Ruguru yet, the two of us. We did um, Carnival once, but it's just like, do you want to play a game? She's usually like, no, I don't want to. And I'm like, okay. 
whatever, I guess. And then I, I end up <laughs> sitting down and watching something with her, or I end up working on a game or a book that I've been working on for a while, uh, um, doing side projects here and there. So not a whole lot of gaming, actually, sadly. Other than, you know, stuff that I will save for technical time, because I don't want to weigh down, I don't want to front load this podcast so much. Well, too late. <laughs> We're doing it. <laughs> yeah, uh, I wish I had something to add to the conversation, but I've just been working and, um, you know, doing doing the standard Christmas celebrations and mm. wrapping and presents and blah de blah blah mm-hmm. Uh, but come January 1st, things calm down in my office, so I'll get some sweet, sweet free time and thoughts again. Looking forward to it. It's two days away. I can make it, I swear. <laughs> so tonight, we've got a lot to catch up on on the, the news and article front. We've got a couple of guest articles. FFG has not slowed down the, the press train, even though uh, releases have slowed a bit. And uh, for our discussion topic tonight, we're finally going to get around to talking a little bit about Lovecraft lore. We're going to talk about some favorites that we have, what we're hoping for the game, so on and so forth. Guys, let's do it. Yeah. Nick, guest articles. We've had some. Yes, uh, we've had two the last couple weeks. The first one is titled Introduction to Engagement. It was written by Peter Hopkins. And in this guest article, he tackles the um, task of explaining exactly what engagement means, how the rules define it, um, and how the game sort of plays with the idea of engagement. Um, When one investigator is engaged, what you can do to help that investigator, what the drawbacks or the the, um, benefits are, and kind of how to take advantage of engagement or disengagement um, to increase your odds for success. So it's a pretty... Uh, interesting article, um, and even if you're someone who you feel pretty confident about engagement, it's it's a good read just to give yourself that little bit of brush up too. So, um, nice nice look at that there. And I feel like, I feel like like, God, it's got to be a full seventy five percent of the rules questions that come oh, up yeah. on forums or in or sometimes even in our our rules discussion on Discord are enemy related, and most of the enemy questions have to do with either spawning or engaging. Mm-hmm. So. It is definitely worth your time to go read it. <laughs> yep, definitely. And, uh, and then our next article just went up today. Uh, it was supposed to be tomorrow, but I, I you know, hit the, the publish button and set a schedule. Um, and it is... You blew it. I blew it. I messed up. So this is my last <laughs> podcast. I'm announcing my resignation from Mythbusters. <laughs> <laughs> no, we've already revoked all of your admin rights, so it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, this one is called The Cost of Altruism in Arkham, and it was written by Derek Carroll. Uh, and this is an interesting look at the idea of an altruistic play style or taking one for the team, uh, the benefits, um, what it means for your campaign. If you were to uh, say in a, he compares like decision making with solo versus having a teammate in this specific instance, Daisy solo versus Daisy and skids, um, what it would mean for future scenarios if one of those characters were to allow themselves to be defeated in order to let the other investigator finish the the act um, or finish the scenario before moving on rather than having it time out or whatever Uh, so it's an interesting um, perspective as far as like I I know and even anybody who was here for our live stream I played Roland and I probably could have let myself get defeated but I was like nope I'm gonna resign I don't want to take the trauma Um, which I think with Roland I had a good argument for that but but it's an interesting perspective on how even through letting one character, letting one part of the team go down, it could potentially set everyone up for a better outcome in future campaigns. Or future scenarios, rather. It It is a thing to adjust to the idea of playing a co-op game cooperatively entirely, it turns out. <laughs> I don't even think I've been playing Lord of the Rings for almost five years now. I don't even think I'm there in that game yet. You've been playing I too still... much with Brandon. <laughs> well, <there's> that. <laughs> uh, but that that idea of you know one win all win. Mm-hmm. Maybe the sacrifice is the good play. Maybe you're the guy to lay down on the grenade. Ooh, I think Boromir bomb. I think at Arkham, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> or Boromir bomb. I think we did. We have someone who did it. Nick in our first campaign at Arkham Knights, I feel like someone 
in the third scenario where you know things kind of converge on that one location yes someone did something there one um you're right i can't remember i know two people got defeated and then you and i as agnes and roland just pieced out um and i can't remember <laughs> oh yeah that, that i happened. can't remember <laughs> i think i want to say it was um daniel and patrick that got defeated at the end of scenario three but i'm not i'm not positive and here I was hoping that you were going to remind me that it was me. No. <laughs> and that I am, in fact, a good person. Nope, I remember that Roland and Agnes left, and I was like, sweet, so we live. And then I read the, the campaign guide, and I was like, oh, no, everybody dies. Aw. Spoiler. Spoiler alert. Yeah, post, post <laughs> spoiler <the> alert. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It, it it will be interesting. I think it's probably a little easier to take the hit in the corset scenario since it's only three in a row. But I'm interested to see how much more of a consideration that's going to be when we've got. And, you know, I think we're presuming that the, you know, deluxe plus cycle uh, campaigns are going to be, what, eight scenarios, we think? I think that two in the yeah, box, it seems, seems like, like it. from Dunwich yeah. and six mm -hmm. six packs to follow. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Ooh, that's that's a lot longer time to carry some trauma around with you. Yeah, I know. I, I'm just really looking forward to seeing how it plays out in that very final scenario after you've been playing with a crew for what, like eight scenarios? Maybe you throw throw in a few side scenarios, so you're gonna have a lot invested in that character by the end, and maybe mm -hmm. someone will have to do a a tearful sacrifice for the good of the <laughs> of the group. <laughs> but in its defense, those are the good stories. Yes, definitely. Those are the stories you tell. Um, so, yeah. I liked that article. It's a different perspective, especially if you've only ever played competitive card games before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we're also trained to ha to just have that deck and, you know, those games we play that it's just kind of that, like, my precious mentality, like, you know, like, the, <laughs> it's all about my deck and what I'm doing. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think the core mechanics do a good job at least to train you into that that altruistic mindset with the uh the skill discards. Cuz I think a lot of times even when you're not really thinking about it, you go like, "Oh, I could probably throw this overpower at him." Mhm. Mm yeah. Anyway, <laughs> good articles. Is that the last one for this round? Yes, those were the the two that we had for this episode, so thank you very much to uh Peter and Derek for writing those. And as always, if Anybody else wants to write an article for the Mythos Busters uh, um, website, you can find that information on how to do that at mythosbusterspodcast.wordpress.com. Sweet. So we've had uh, one, two, three, four, five, kind of, and a half, four a and a half. <laughs> four, four and a, we'll go four and a quarter. <laughs> uh, articles come out from FFG. So I think Tom and Ian, you guys are going to tag team these. So I'll let you take it over. Sure. So yeah, this first article that we have uh, came out actually a month ago, right after I think you guys recorded the last podcast. And this one <laughs> that is called... That is the podcast curse. <laughs> yeah, it always Pay attention that on uh, Friday the 30th. There will probably be an article. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this one is called Strange Solution. And it's another little preview or a peek at uh, what's to come in the Dunwich Legacy Deluxe Box. And the article opens with kind of going over, um, or at least reminding us, of different ways that this card game has uh, kind of broken the mold in some aspects of, like, the LCG, um, you know, what we're what we're used to seeing out of LCGs and what we've seen in, in uh, Lord of the Rings and, and other co-op stuff. How we've had a card game that is also a role-playing experience and how we are including um, these weakness or negative cards in our own player decks, which is kind of these new ways of, of treating this card game. And here we're presented with a card with no recognizable purpose. So this Aside card, from being awesome. Yeah. So this card <laughs> is called Strange Solution. It is a uh, Seeker card, a, a, zero, a level zero Seeker asset with one, uh, a cost of one. It's got a wild um, skill pip. It has the traits item and science. And it reads, action, test intellect four. If you succeed, discard Strange Solution and draw two cards. Record in your campaign log that you 
have identified the solution. <laughs> and oh, that, that is it. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, we're left kind of scratching our heads with what the hell is this card used for? Um, I mean, yeah, you could say, it. okay, you can test it and you can draw two cards, but the action advantage is not there no. with, you know, adding this card and drawing it and all that kind of stuff. So really the, the purpose of including it is to identify this strange solution. And we have no idea what that means. <laughs> oh my <laughs> God. That's amazing. I, I So the real question comes up and Scott just mentioned it in the discord chat here is, do you ever not put this in your deck? That's, you know, how can you resist? It's interesting because I think I think that it's 100% auto include for the Dunwich campaign. Like I don't think there's any question about that. Oh, you you, you think they're going to pay it off that quickly? Well, I think it's I'm going to say it's 100% auto include anytime you're playing through a fresh campaign, like the first time you play a blind campaign playthrough. Yeah, no, I'd agree to that too. Cuz you don't know what's going to come. Mm-hmm. Um it's going to be interesting to see, like, once you've played through a given campaign one or more times and seeing what, you know, this might result in, right. then you might have a different opinion on it. But going in as we are blind into the Dunw- Dunwich Legacy campaign, hell yeah, I'm going to include it, <laughs> and I want to see what it does. <laughs> so now, is this something <laughs> so, that you throw into your your off-class characters <clears throat> that can support Seeker? Like, do you think it's that big of a, like, would if you were running Roland, for whatever reason, um, would you put two of this? <laughs> Who would do that? Like, yeah, like it's like, mm. but at the same time, if I'm running a solo campaign and I haven't, I've only gotten to X scenario with other people who have played Daisy and it's like, I don't know if this comes up later on. Like, mm. hard to say. I mean, it's a test, it's a test of four, which is rather high. So, you know, if, if Roland's not kitted out to handle that, mm-hmm. then it might be kind of some wasted actions there. Right. So you have to build your deck. I like where you're going, Tom. You got to build your Roland deck to, to account for <laughs> yeah <laughs> double down on that that intellect for rolling no i i love so that this exists like I, I can't get over that yeah so i think the reason that this is actually a point of discussion and and i'm sure most people have gleaned that at this point is that we have no idea what this does it could do something awesome it could do something mediocre it might be three cycles before it does anything at all the fact that it's included in the Dunwich cycle means nothing to the Dunwich cycle that we know of. So, oh, God, I love that this card exists, but I have the lingering worry. Like, when you take a power in, a, in an RPG that says the GM may tell you some vital information at a key point, <laughs> I always hesitate to take those powers. I'm like, what if he forgets? What if they don't put the card in that makes this do something? What if it takes three cycles before this does something? See, it's interesting that you bring up the RPG analogy because my brain immediately went to... Because <laughs> you're my constant GM. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, my brain immediately went to the fiction writing analogy, which is this is an open thread. This is a uh, mention of a side character or a musing that the author had in chapter two of book one that that come book five, he's like, I need something to resolve this current situation. Oh, yeah, there's this open thread that I never dealt with. There we go. It, it, oh, this is this is Chekhov's gun in card form. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> it, it's just so cool seeing the, the unique structure of this game paying off, not just in, you know, we've seen these kind of, like, res- decisions made in... Uh, in the form of like encounter cards and campaign choices, but to see it in player cards too is like, it's just really already like pushing what this game can do and what it can be. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's amazing. Um, and, and I think it is kind of a, a, a personality or gamer personality test too. Cause some one of those players out there, you know who you are, who are just all about efficiency or like, nah, I think <laughs> I'm just going to include these other cards, but if you're that type of person who you see the mystery box, you just got to know what's in the mystery box, then <laughs> this is the card for you. I don't feel it's necessarily a two of include for me, because if you succeed at it, then then what? Like, okay, I draw the second copy. Well, well yeah. yeah. Well, and what's nice about this is that, and again, kind of thinking less in the single scenario sense and more in the meta sense, Say you include two of this in your deck, and especially in like a Daisy deck where she's like getting a four willpower test is going to be nothing for her. And you find it and get it in the first scenario. 
Well, guess what you replace with your experience? Exactly. Yeah. Because it's in it's it's True. in your campaign log now. So that's that is that was the biggest thing that I didn't I didn't see right away that I'm like I, I realized later like oh, okay that's that's less conditional now just like set it forget it get it done in you know the first scenario and then you know replace whatever you need to later I don't know God. I love I love the existence of this card mm-hmm. and just kind of the wackiness that they're pulling into this game straight away. Like other other LCGs that I've collected kind of find their wackiness, but it's usually a little bit later down the line. We are coming out of the gates firing with this game. Yeah, really. <laughs> Free splash yeah. and investigators, strange solutions that doesn't actually do anything. <laughs> I also like the side of of Seeker, like the the cards so far have been kind of cool for that class, but they haven't attracted me like other cards. But if they keep doing this wacky stuff, I'd be more inclined to <laughs> to give them a try. Mm-hmm. <laughs> or you can just continue to play Jenny and throw the Seeker cards in if you feel like it, because yeah, she can yeah. do that. Yeah, that's always a thing. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, sorry, Tom. We we kind of. No, that was that's basically we, we the, the culmination of the uh, of the article because the article is really highlighting this one card, and rightfully so because, as we can tell, it generates a lot of discussion. Um, <laughs> now I'm yeah, so that's the strange solution article. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to be uh, devil's advocate, or not really devil's advocate, but I'm going to be that guy. I'm going to be that guy and say that as much as I love what this article did and how it brought this out and everything, part of me. The, the part of me that grew up in the 90s really wanted this card to not be mentioned anywhere until I opened the box and pulled it out and went, what the heck is this? The part sure. of me that, that <laughs> you know, that, like, is walking down the aisle of a Target store and would be like, oh, this game came out? Rather than now we hear about video games from the moment of their conception. You know, that sort of thing. Like, the part of me that didn't want to oh. know anything about it. <laughs> Oh, I, I kind of wish we could. Don't live in that so I'm world not. Anymore. I'm not the only one who is tired of living in spoiler culture. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, I, yeah. I agree. But I am very it's happy that I know it exists. Like, I'm not going to complain at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we'll revisit this. I'm sure with with <clears throat> m- much discussion <laughs> when some campaign log in the future finally says if you have identified the solution do x badass thing what if it's bad <laughs> that would be amazing has anyone thought about that what if it's bad <laughs> that'd be incredible i mean i wouldn't put it past matt newman no. or nate i would do something i like would that stand and applaud them at my gaming table with too. my wife so uh, like the the boss monster finds it and his power level grows to over nine thousand. is that is Pretty that much. the bad thing that happens <laughs> Could be. That was exactly what I was thinking, Sean. You nailed it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. By all accounts, it should not even exist. <laughs> yeah, the flavor text is next? great. Um, <laughs> next, Ian, do you want to take uh take this a next article here? Yeah. No, oh, wait. Hang so, on. Hang on. Oh, before yes. we move on. Before we move on. Related to this, though, it's probably a little tangential. How are you guys handling kind of the the talking about spoilery? How are you guys handling the campaign guides? So, for instance, it just kind of set the stage for the conversation here. I only read the parts that I quote unquote earn. And sometimes they're bad and you don't really earn them. You fail into them. But I only read the campaign book as I play through and the parts that I'm immediately, you know, encountering. Have you guys been... You know, I could see the other common approach to that being like, oh, hey, I played one time through. I kind of got, you know, I, I got the mystery out of my system. Let's, you know, read this cover to cover and see what all the possible options are. Where no, are you I'm guys with, sitting on that continuum? I, I'm with you. I, I try to play. I like to play where you live with your choices and that's the resolution that you get. And you got to live with that. Um you know, I I have snuck a peek. I will say I've I've wavered and I've snuck a peek at like one or two of the other resolutions, but I haven't. I've certainly not read like cover to cover on everything because I don't want to spoil the rest of it. Or when I play through with some other people or this or that, I I kind of want to see it with fresh eyes when we if we choose a new resolution. With fresh eyes. <laughs> um, I am I'm the kind of person where I stay in the dark as much as possible on the first playthrough of it, but then immediately. 
after that playthrough is done. I don't go through the campaign guide, but I go through the encounter deck and read everything that I didn't see in the encounter deck and the out-of-play cards and that sort of thing. Um, that campaign mm. guide, uh, yeah, that I only read as it comes up. The only exception I can think of was Curse the Rougarou, which was when we're playing that and a certain card came up and there was a, that had an effect similar to kind of what Strange Solution did where it mentioned something and we're like, what is what does that mean? Yeah. What is what is this doll? And then after we finish it, I had to look it up and be like, what happens with this? Yeah. But yeah, that mm. first time is always is always. Yeah, I know the curiosity got the better of us. The better of us. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It was it was really tough because just like it lays out this big litany of things, and it's like, what are all these things, and why? How could I do them, and what happens when I do? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, okay, so that that's actually about what I expected. Now we, if I remember correctly, we all also answered that we we throw our random weakness in uh, face down the first scenario, right? Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, so maybe maybe there's that we're missing that that person on the podcast who's like, no, I look at my random weakness. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. I just wanted to check to see how the how you guys have been handling kind of the story and the campaign no, element of it. Mm-hmm. So for sure. Sorry, Ian. Move on. Yeah, I feel like Lord of the Rings kind of trained me too because recently in the past, however many cycles of that LCG, they started doing this text that says, "Do not read until you <laughs> finish the quest." And I've actually been like in big comple- red comple- caps. Yeah, I've been completely loyal to that, so <laughs> I've carried that over to Arkham as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so the next article was a big surprise to me, mm-hmm. and I think pretty much everyone else, which was the announcement of a new standalone scenario, the Carnivale of Hor- Horrors, at, at least that's how I pronounce it. Um, Carnivale. And this kind of came Italian. out of nowhere. There was no kind of build up to it or or whispers about it uh and i was pretty surprised because to get a a brand new uh standalone so close after the game's release and so close after ruguru was totally surprising but (laughs) definitely not unwelcome um yes ffg please continue this precedent (laughs) (laughs) you will hear no complaints every two months yeah a new a new scenario every two months (laughs) <laughs> yeah so so i don't know what this says uh, about how often these are going to be released or if they just kind of wanted to to get some in the can right away to go with our first campaign but either way um so this one uh like the rougarou before it uh as i said a standalone so it's using all its own encounter cards this one is taking us all the way to venice and uh, is basically fo- focusing on kind of this big festival that's happening. People are wearing masks. And of course, uh, as they do, cultists are using the opportunity to <laughs> uh, engage in their shady dealings under the cover of those masks. So you have to try to unmask them as you go along. Uh, so have all of you guys had a chance to play this? or Yeah. I just received uh, it. I have not had a chance to play it yet. Mm. Oh, it's so good. But I know you guys picked it up like from FFG like a day or two after an announcement, right? It it just happened to be that Nick was in my area like the day this released. So we we managed to meet up and play it on the day. Yeah, my family. It's, uh, awesome. it's good. My, I would say my sister who lives uh, near the FFG center uh, just happened to pick the perfect day to do a baby shower. So uh, I got <laughs> to drive my wife there and then be like, all right, I'm going to play games for a couple hours. See you later. So, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Oh, yeah, that was the day where it blizzarded oh, on my, your way Yeah, home. and I had to, like, skedaddle out of there before the roads became undrivable. <laughs> skedaddle. <laughs> <laughs> Record in your campaign log that Nick has skedaddled. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime I resign. It's, uh, <laughs> but it's... <laughs> it's a really cool scenario and I am not a terribly well traveled person but Italy is one place I've been I've actually performed at San Marco's Basilica oh cool uh, so it was actually really cool to see some actual places that I recognized although of course terrible things <laughs> terrible things were in them I'm crossing my fingers for <laughs> I, the I've seen them in Assassin's center. Creed 2 <laughs> <The greater Minnesota. laughs> Uh, no, Assassin's I'm... Creed 2 is one of my favorite video games, mm-hmm. so this was a, a kind of a cool yes. reminder of that, I feel oh, like. God, the classic 2. That one was so yeah. good. Yeah. 
but yeah, I, re- I know if you go back, but <laughs> I, I'm sure it is a lot of a lot of games are better through nostalgia, but um, uh, the, yeah, this uh, this scenario is pretty amazing. I won't say too much for spoiler sake, but uh, I think both this and Ruguru, all the you know, I I love the core set scenarios, but these two really show kind of how far the game system can stretch and what it's capable of and you know crazy stuff it can do in them with the map in this case the map is like in a in a circular formation and does stuff with like clockwise and counterclockwise so i don't know i think i think just the sky's the limit both with our regular stuff and they can do pretty much anything they want with these standalone scenarios mm-hmm. and i love the movement of that cuz you know yeah. you know when you have those uh those scenes in movies where you're in like a masquerade and everyone's dancing and it's like claustrophobic and whoever's kind of moving through the crowd kind of feels like they have to go with the flow of the crowd. And it's just kind of like, it's like you're forced by this, this, this throng of people to kind of just go with the flow. That's exactly what this scenario feels like. And it's so cool. Yep, definitely. So, so this one's available now. If you haven't gotten a chance to get it, you definitely should comes highly recommended. And uh, uh, those with thalassophobia, like me, <laughs> um, you know, maybe pop a Valium beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> so that was Carnival of Horrors. The next article was announcing the third uh, Mythos pack in the Dunwich Legacy cycle after the Miskatonic Museum. And the second one was, is it the Essex Express, I believe? Essex County yes. Express. Mm-hmm. There yeah, so this is uh, Blood on the Altar. Uh, that sounds promising. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, that sounds like a fun jaunt through uh, Dunwich. I'm so it sure sounds like no way that this scenario will end poorly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely not. So apparently after getting off the train, we are going to be in the actual village of Dunwich. We um, made it. Yeah, we we made it um, for our nice uh, summer holiday in Dunwich. For some R&R, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we're apparently investigating some disappearances. Of course, we're getting some new player cards, which we can talk about in a second. Um, and it sounds like the, the main idea of the scenario is looking for a secret chamber and that we're going to have to kind of look throughout the town to to find it and find out what's going on there. And find the key to it. And find the key to it, right. So having read the Dunwich Horror as one of my first Lovecraft pieces, seeing visually, it actually matches very closely what I imagine Dunwich looking like. There, at least the locations. Just decrepit mm. and, <laughs> and, and creepy and run down and like overgrown and just... just or what 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 does Lovecraft always call it? Decadent, just in just in a state of decay. Yeah. Oh God, the art in this game is just so on point all the time. For me, especially with um, one of the location arts that they show at the bottom of this article, uh, Bishop's Brook was like one hundred and ten percent exactly what I pictured for the Dunwich area when I was reading that. So yeah, I mean, phenomenal job capturing that that essence of that story with these cards. I'll also be interested to see if we can catch, because storyline wise, the, the Dunwich legacy takes place after the Dunwich mm-hmm. horror. Mm-hmm. Hence the name. I'll be interested to see if there are any Easter eggs to be found either in the cards or the flavor text or the art uh, that would, that would hint back to things that only people who have read the Dunwich horror would catch. Uh, knowing these guys, I'm going to say yes. Yeah. That would yeah, seem very fitting, you know. Mm-hmm. Was it was it Nate or Matt that mentioned that the Dunwich horror was his favorite? Because the other one said Mountains of Madness. I don't remember. I want to say it was Matt. I want to say it was Matt. Yeah, I'm not so, sure. Yeah, looking forward to that. Everyone, keep your eyes peeled and tell us if you tell us if you find him. All right. <laughs> so, in terms of player cards, we. I uh, get told that this pack uh, is going to focus on permanent versions of talent cards. Yeah. Um, 
It also says we're going to get a higher version of emergency cash. So this kind of answers the question of whether we were going to get higher level versions of the corset cards. And apparently we are. So uh, I guess, Sean, did you want to read this one since you had an excited (laughs) exclamation about it? (laughs) I'm just excited, as I'm sure everyone is, that these corset staples are not going to languish as the card pool grows. (laughs) Mm -hmm. At least I don't think they will. Um, so our upgraded emergency cache is a uh, level two neutral card, zero cost still, supply traded, gain three resources, and draw one card. So it becomes a cantrip, to quote the magic term, as much as it pains <laughs> me. <laughs> so that's awesome. As we've said before card draw in this game is not always just like in in other games it's just always good you never don't want to draw cards but i still feel like that's really good oh yeah replacing itself in addition to drawing resources it's this is now a i can't even remember and i i honestly i don't believe in like pure click economy i feel like that was kind of big in in netrunner kind of equating cards to how many clicks it would take to get the same action I don't believe in in that so much. But adding another action into what was already a good card, I'm super on board. Yeah, and I think that adding the draw card is a a good upgrade. I mean, they could have increased the resource amount, which would have been cool, but I think that drawing the card really makes it feel like it's more versatile. Um, And yeah, like we've talked about before, that does mean there's a potential to draw into a weakness, but that... I still, it's hard for me to see draw a card as a potential hazard. Like, even though the weaknesses are in the deck, I still want to draw frequently. So, I'm very happy to see this <laughs> this upgrade. I mean, you're going to find that weakness anyway, right? Exactly. So, yeah. unless unless you know that weakness is, uh, is it paranoia? No, it's amnesia. So, unless you know that weakness is amnesia... <laughs> draw with reckless abandon you're gonna hit it anyway just just get it over with mm-hmm. it'll be less painful well, and even still wouldn't most cases. weaknesses wouldn't you want them to hit the table earlier in the game rather than towards the end when you're bearing down on the last few actions so god especially freaking cover up yeah. or hospital deaths <laughs> yes or dark memory <laughs> <laughs> or abandoned and alone i was I'm, I'm, or pretty much every other screw one screw the yeah. necronomicon yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so it's it's I I, I kind of take the same approach where I just draw and mm-hmm. kind of throw caution to the wind. I, I think the the more difficult part will be just kind of we're going to be getting more options at those higher experience. So choosing what to upgrade is going to become more and more difficult um, and kind of making those choices between cards like this, which are kind of those like foundation mm-hmm. level effects and others that are the more like flashy potentially game saving effects. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think something that we've not really talked about as far as card draw goes in this game is kind of the inherent value of flexibility. Hmm. And the bigger hand you have, inherently the more flexible you are in playing because yep. I feel like this game it's way more about how you play and the decisions you make on the board versus the cards you include in your deck. Um, than any other game, at least any other LCG at the moment. Uh, deck building is still really important, but I feel like it's slightly less so compared to your actual play strategy. The closest that I can think um, for a comparison to this is, uh, at least from LCGs, is Star Wars and how there were the Force icons that you could commit to engagements. Um, and sure. and that mm-hmm. like that game blew wide open for me when I suddenly realized... Like, if this card sits in my hand for longer than a turn, I should just commit it to a force engagement and then just draw back up to my hand. Now, it's different with Arkham because you only draw one card each turn unless you spend actions for it. But, like, the fact that they put skill icons on them, that every card or most every card is dual use, like, like there's no reason to hang on to cards for longer than a turn or two, really, especially when you're getting onto the wire and the situation to, to use that card hasn't come up yet. So, 
I would agree with mm-hmm. you, Sean. That's the long way to say I would agree with you, you Sean, that it's more about how you play and less about how you build your deck. I can't wait to see a level 5 emergency quiche that has uh, fast on it. Quiche? <laughs> Good old emergency, emergency quiche. quiche. I, might, I might give over I might give over to emergency quiche at this point. It's... it's... I've, 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 been, I've, been, I've been mispronouncing it quiche for a very long time, but quiche, quiche is kind of kind of better. It's, it's the taste uh, you just have this artwork... <laughs> I have this artwork stuck in my head of like this quiche behind the glass that you just need to break the glass. Break the glass. <laughs> case in of case emergency. of emergency, break glass, eat quiche. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Uh, so the other player cards um, are. It says we're getting five new permanent talents, yes. which <gasps> seems like that'll pr- probably be one for each class. Mm-hmm. Um, and they spoil two of them here. The first one is Keen Eye, yeah. which is the Guardian one. Uh, Nick, did you want to read this one? Gladly. With keen Eye. <laughs> this is uh, Keen Eye. It's a Guardian asset. It's a level three asset. It is a permanent card, so it has no cost. It has the talent trait, and it has the free action, spend two resources. You get plus one intellect until the end of the phase, or free action, spend two resources, you get plus one combat until the end of the phase. Yes, please. One of each, right now. (laughs) (laughs) I think there's a couple things about this card that uh, kind of didn't hit me immediately, but then when you start thinking about it, first is the permanent means that you start the game with Mm -hmm. it um and i think that's always an option sometimes what throws me off about the talents are you have to spend an action and the resources to get it on the board in this case no resources and it starts on the board um and then also you have to spend two resources to get the plus one but it lasts until the end of the phase so you know, there's a lot of turns where you're just spending all your actions to punch an enemy, so you could spend two and you're getting plus one for every punch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's true. I mean, yeah, it's two resources does seem steep right at the outset, but then you realize, oh, I don't have to draw this. I don't right. have to play it. Right. It's just there, ready to go. And like you said, it lasts to the end of the phase, so if you're doing multiple uh, combat actions or multiple um, you know, investigations or whatever, then you can you can spend that thing just one time and get its bonus for the rest of the phase. Yeah, and I, I feel like Ian hit it on the head that, like, I feel like the turns where you are fighting and then investigating are fewer and farther between than the turns than, like, I need to clear this location out, or I need to smash the face of this enemy in, right? Right, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So, there's that as well. And let's also talk about the fact that this is a Guardian card with an intellect buff. That's cool. It's <laughs> pretty cool. Uh, yeah. Which... I don't know. This seems like a Zoe card to me. It's it's good for everyone, but obviously Zoe with her ability to to grab resources with enemies, it seems it seems like an obvious grab for her. Yeah, with how Roland, especially for solo. I'll say with how Roland has gone for me in some games, this this would be a little bit harder to fuel with him, um, unless I do get those emergency quiches out and I do have a, a, a wealth <laughs> of resources. But um, regardless of the fact, any time that I can take a card out of my deck and put it into play at the start of the game, I'm going to do it. Like, there, it's you're reducing the odds of, uh, or you're eliminating the, the, the idea that you need to draw into the card, and you're literally just starting with another tool in play. So I don't see a reason not. I can't remember what the rules say. Do permanent cards count toward your deck size? They must. I think they do, yeah. No. Oh, they don't? No. No, they don't. Okay, that's the thing. So when you buy this, it's uh, let's see, right in the article it says, because permanent assets don't count against your deck size, you don't need to swap out any other cards in order to include either of these, uh, either mm. these permanent assets. So I can hang on yeah, to my knife. Avoid that that awful choice. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Always drop the goddamn knife. Never include the knife. <laughs> It's such a bad card. We haven't gotten to our core set card reviews yet, but those are forthcoming. And oh man, I'm going to lay into the knife. <laughs> Spoiler so alert. <laughs> um, man yells at knife. <laughs> is that a Simpsons headline? That's what it sounds like. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I see you played knifey yelly before. <laughs> so <laughs> the, the other talent um was well i guess it's Mm -hmm. technically not a talent it doesn't have the talent trait it has the spell and pack trait this is blood pact the the Mm -hmm. mystic as permanent asset 
Um, I guess by all rights, this should be Sean's card, but since he already, already nice. read it, I'll, I'll give it to I'll give it to Tom to read. <laughs> all right, Blood Blood Pact is a uh, three level three Mystic card. It's permanent, so it has no cost. And it has the uh, free triggered ability, add one Doom to Blood Pact. You get plus three willpower for this skill test, limit once per skill test. It also has another free triggered ability, add one Doom to Blood Pact. You get plus three combat for this skill test, limit once per skip per test. Whew. Yeah. Sounds good. I mean, it sounds, da- well, it sounds right up, myst- it sounds perfect for yes. Mystic, really, is what it is. Mm-hmm. Um. Because yeah, that doom adding a doom to the card, uh, that's that's yeah. that's a steep cost right in of itself. But if you really need to get uh, that plus three to pass a test, then it might be worth it. You know, I so can guys, actually see because because you only typically check, barring some card effect, you only typically check the doom threshold at the start of the next round. There so it is. If if you're like at the threshold during during the game during the round, then yeah, just pile on this. So um, it turns out that the agenda will advance mm-hmm. regardless of your best efforts. <laughs> True. So there's this magical twilight time where the agenda is going to advance. We call it magic hour. We do call <laughs> or it the magic witching hour. hour. <laughs> it's spell time. Um, yeah. And then you just go ham. Mm-hmm. Um, so I could see this. I really wish Agnes could take survival instinct or no will will to survive. Whichever the what's the survivor card that lets you not draw chaos tokens? <laughs> I can't remember. I the name. believe that's will to survive. Yeah, I'm pretty sure at Arkham Knights I mistakenly included that in an Agnes deck because I didn't check the level. <laughs> um, and it turns out there's a reason it's level three or four, whatever it is. But anyway, level yeah. three, yeah. Yeah, I think the fact that you start this in play, it's conditional. Doesn't cost any resources, doesn't cost any cards. Like when you need that boost, you can get it. And in, in in that magical twilight time, when the agenda's going anyway, just go. Yeah. It it also strikes me as kind of the 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 boss beater card, you know, if mm-hmm. you're if you're getting down to the end and you have a couple doom to spare and you're facing down some big enemy, then it seems like the perfect time to use it. Mm-hmm. Every time is the perfect time to use it. <laughs> well, that's not true. <laughs> that's just because you're afraid of doom. This combined with the other Mystic cards is going to give other players lots of reasons to punch Mystic players. So I'm just glad it has the limit once gonna... per test clause on there. That's going to save Sean and I a lot of arguments. <laughs> uh, I think I think the Mystic class is probably going to be the reason uh, of much stomach acid production <laughs> in in play groups. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's and this thing. card probably singly <laughs> will be. Yeah, the biggest culprit. But <laughs> I, I love the design of it. Mm-hmm. It's it's exactly what they promised with the Mystic class. It's mm-hmm. playing with a high cost for a really high benefit. Have we seen anything outside of the shotgun that's given anything close to this much of a, a stat boost? I don't think so. Now what we need, where this becomes amazing, is when they start coming out with any Mystic cards that give you an additional bonus if you succeed by a certain amount. <laughs> yeah. Currently, we have none that I'm aware of, uh, but once we get a couple, this 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 stock increases. Mm-hmm. Buy now, sell later. <laughs> All right, so that was I think that's about it for the player cards and the rest of the blood on the altar uh, article. Uh, so we've got kind of the first half of the cycle spoiled, and then we'll see about the next half over the upcoming weeks as they release the next articles, I think. Um, so we did get one final article, um, one final official article, which was another preview of the Denoch legacy, which recently has gone to shipping. Um, and the expected date is January 12th, which is <gasps> exciting. <laughs> Uh, so this article doesn't necessarily give uh, anything in terms of player card spoilers, but it does explain a little bit more about um, kind of how the campaign's going to work and how your choices play into it. 
And one of the big choices you have to make right out of the gate is uh, there's going to be two scenarios in the Dunwich Legacy expansion, and you're going to have the choice of which scenario to take on first and which to do second. And uh, according so cool. to the article, the experience is going to be different depending on the order you choose. My favorite part about this article is that they wrote the article as if it were like real life campaign text. <laughs> <laughs> you tear away the cellophane and open the box. Inside, you'll get your first look at the mystery. <laughs> They're having like the marketing department is having a ball with yeah, Arkham right now, and I am loving fun. it myself. <laughs> Yeah, they, they really are. You can tell they're having fun with it. I think everyone's having fun with this game, the designers, <laughs> marketing, the players. Um, so we've already know that this is kind of going to focus one scenario on the Miskatonic University, the other on the Clover Club. I'm I'm looking forward to the gambling den aspect. There you go. But, um, uh, As a side note, did anybody think when they were saying you could do these two uh, scenarios in any order, I somehow flash back to Legend of Zelda oracle of ages and oracle of seasons those two games oh my god i haven't thought about those games in a long time <laughs> i know it's a throwback but they would lead into the I, other yeah sorry. i had i had high hopes for those uh, and my brother and i treated them like uh, pokemon red and uh -huh. blue and i played seasons i never got around to ages <laughs> Sorry for the massive tangent. Uh, go ahead, Ian. Continue, please. <laughs> no problem. Um, so, uh, as as far as kind of the further details we get, it says we're going to be meeting with Dr. Armitage, Armitage, who is in the Dunwich Horror Story. Yeah, um, he is. So we are going to get some of those characters. Um, and basically... At each of these places, we're looking for someone. We're looking for Professor Warren Rice at the Miskatonic University. And Dr. Francis Morgan is apparently getting down at the Clover Club. So we have to uh, pick who we're going to look for first. Um, and they also dropped in the article kind of the campaign log. So we get the names of the last three packs in the cycle, mm -hmm. um, which looks like it's Undimensioned and Unseen, Where Doom Awaits, and Lost in Time and Space. Sick. Oh, boy. That terrifies me. <laughs> I have abstained from looking at the campaign log. Um, yes, I haven't looked at it either. As... as as per my prior thing, but I'm glad I'm glad that those were in there. So that actually, that's cool because with Lord of the Rings, the um the the kind of story for each pack is included in each pack. So like I've got a stack, I could probably you know start a fire, a healthy <laughs> fire, with the amount of Lord of the Rings inserts that I own because each pack has one. But do we think that basically everything's going to be in the deluxe, and you don't have to worry about? The, the extra paper in the the single packs. I don't know. I, I I get the feeling there's still going to be a rule sheet insert for each for each uh, mythos pack. Uh, yeah, either, I think there's enough stuff for them to talk about. I'd say either that, or we'll see it like we have with the print on demand scenarios, where there's just three or four cards that are front and back. If you know resolution one, resolution two, that sort of thing. So, yeah, I, mm -hmm. I could see it being included in the mythos mythos packs instead of the deluxe box. I like the idea of everything being contained in one nice little insert, but yeah, I suppose we'll see. Mm -hmm. At least storyline wise, um, you know, taking taking a cue from something like first uh, Game of Thrones first edition, like when they added new keywords or something like that, they had to include an insert that uh, that explained that keyword, because basically, as as rules authors, they always have to assume like, oh, this person might have picked up a core. Mm. And this pack only, we have to explain anything new that we add. So yeah, I could see it. I could definitely see it in that situation. Also, since I uh, so okay, Francis Morgan. Now I'm going to jump ahead to our discussion a little bit. But he is that a character from the Dunwich Horror? Yeah, the, there was the three of them. So there were the three. Mm -hmm. uh, spoiler alert for Dunwich Horror. If you haven't read, <laughs> yet, please go do so. It's old and public domain, so you have no excuse. Right. Um, but Armitage, Henry, and Morgan were the three who go to Dunwich and end right. up taking on the okay. the dark young that's that's you know out there. Well, I had I pointed assume. out. 
Wilbur's or Wilbur's brother is a dark young, right? Is that is that how that worked? I can't remember if the I can't remember the exact actually relation, categorizes yeah. it that way. Um. Well, I had pointed out in one in an earlier episode about scrying the artwork being uh, an homage to Twin Peaks and the the video game um, Deadly Premonition, and uh, Francis Morgan is the name of the main character in Deadly Premonition, Francis York Morgan. So I got a little excited when I read that, and I was like, "Well, wait a minute, no, this guy could could have existed before that." So I was hoping to find another another little tie into something that I like, other but not quite. So never mind then. Ignore that. Ignore what I just said. <laughs> Moving on. Hmm? <laughs> and Tom, you just posted the art of. I, I, did they say what that's tied to? It's just I, art in the article. Yeah, they just have a of piece a of dude. art in the article, and I think it's, it's phenomenal. A, it's great it's art. Like yeah. Looking it's in great. a shattered mirror, and pieces of the shattered mirror re- are revealing like a different version of himself that's all twisted and weird looking. Yeah, like Freddy Krueger. Yeah, and it's he looks amazing. like the scrotal version of himself. <laughs> <laughs> sure, <laughs> that's that's one adjective you can use. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> This actually is is extremely evocative of one scene that completely scarred me as a child. I was so wimpy when it came to scary stuff. Um, And I saw the original poltergeist at a cousin's house. And that scene where the dude's looking in the mirror and, like, he pushes into his own face and it starts disintegrating. (laughs) Oh, my God. That haunted me for years. Mm. Clearly, I'm the only one. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, thanks for backing me up there, guys. Anytime. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> so that was pretty much it for that article. Uh, we're just kind of looking forward to the release. Um, the other big thing, though, the I guess the final thing, was the Investigators of Arkham Horror book came out um, for those who had pre-ordered it, and then it'll come out for general release. Uh, sometime in January. For those who did pre-order it, though, they got uh, advanced copies of the Marie Lambeau Investigator. Um, mm-hmm. My copy just and arrived we- about ten minutes before we started recording today. Oh so God! Every nice. time someone mentions that, like the regret monster <laughs> takes me for not pre-ordering. <laughs> So, so Marie Lambeau is uh, a mystic investigator. She has four will, four intellect, one combat, and three agility. Uh, she has the performer and sorcerer traits. Uh, while you have one or more doom among cards you control, you may take an additional action during your turn, what? which can only be used to play spell cards or activate spell uh, action abilities. Her Elder Sign effect is plus one, and you may add one Doom or remove one Doom from a card you control. Wow. I really, really wish Elder Sign showed up more reliably. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, hey, I'm four up on this investigate test, Elder Sign. Oh, I need to complete this fight test to possibly eke out the non-losing resolution of this quest. Tentacle. <laughs> wow Work, all working against you Sean yeah. always but in her case <laughs> the elder sign is one that even if you're super far ahead you may still be totally okay with it coming out because then it's like alright now I can remove some of that extra doom or now I can ensure that I get an extra action this turn Like before we started recording I had said that I hadn't actually looked at Marie's cards yet and now that I am like I don't know I'm I'm I, I like that Elder Sign effect. I like I like that it's it's one that it's like plus one, yay. But at the same time, if you do draw it when you're way up to begin with, that's it's gonna as Mystic, it's gonna be useful throughout the whole game, like regardless of the test. I do appreciate Elder Sign effects that do something beyond the test that you're mm-hmm. yes. you know <laughs> potentially pulling them for. Oh yeah. So that that definitely is cool. Um, so before we before we talk further about Marie, I feel like we have to talk about her deck because her deck is a wacky. It is, yeah. Mm. Go, Ian. Um, okay, one second. Okay, what? so her deck building options are spell cards level zero to five, meaning she can access hypothetical spell cards outside the mystic class which means those might exist in the future um she can access mystic cards but only level zero to three she can have neutral cards zero to five 
occult cards level zero, <laughs> of which we have none <laughs> so far, and up to five other level zero seeker and or survivor cards. Wow. So this is a TO's nightmare, right? <laughs> like, how do you check for a legal deck? Yeah, oh. <laughs> that, uh, that's hard to keep track of, even <laughs> building it just at home. Um, God, do thing, we have any occult cards yet? I haven't. We, that's that's a trade I haven't know. noticed. Okay. No. So the thing is that they said previously that she was coming from a cycle in the future, in some you know vague future, but I, I you know, we can assume that this is probably going to come from the cycle after Dunwich since we've seen the Dunwich investigators already. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that they're all going to have this kind of wonky, <laughs> like, shopping list deck building options? I mean, I assume so, right? Because they've all kind of all had the same kind of thing if they're in the same release. It's interesting. It's interesting because I think out of the, the core set and when we started to see the, the deck requirements revealed, everybody just assumed that, hey, every investigator is going to have this class subclass thing. Nope. And then the very next investigators we see are like, nope, screw that. Pure class with splash. <laughs> and now we're like, no, kind of class with traits <laughs> and then other traits and then kind of other cards with, with, with class, but only five of them. <laughs> yeah. I'm not even sure how to classify it. Yeah, no, I guess it's kind of it's focused so on traits, I guess. So maybe that's what we'll see is like, maybe you'll have some like, gun master who can access firearm cards and oh yes class. that's why something I need. like that <laughs> <laughs> is that uh is that mark mark harrigan he's the soldier yeah, right? that seems like a good fit yeah the soldier yeah i was thinking of whoever the gangster is from arkham horror the board game but i can't remember his name right oh now. yeah i think michael McGlenn michael mcglenn yeah. yes mcglenn yeah I've been playing a fair amount of Elder Sign, and there's a fair amount of Investigator crossover there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, okay. Marie's wacky, obviously. She's got some signature <laughs> wacky cards, Marie. Though. Yeah, so Mystifying Song is her signature card. Um, did you want to read that one, Sean? Oh, sure. Uh, so it's her signature card. Of course, it is signature <laughs> which is neither neutral nor not neutral. Um, it's an event. It has two wild pips. It is a spell and a song. Marie Lambeau deck only. Fast. When the agenda would advance by reaching its doom threshold. I'm oh, sorry. Play this only when. It, I'm making up words. Play what? when the agenda Jeez. deck would advance. Is by reaching Captain its doom Kirk threshold <laughs> <laughs> until the end of the phase the agenda cannot advance by reaching its doom threshold remove mystifying song from the game Seems so awesome. blood packed anyone exactly <laughs> yeah so okay so does this just stop it for a phase because you don't remove all doom if it right. doesn't advance, right? This isn't just like reset the board of doom. This just no. stops it for a turn. Yeah, it just prevents that check, phase. basically. I think it just prevents that a check during, yeah, during the mythos phase. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. That that's still really good. Yeah. Yes. But it but it's not bomb ass broken. But that's the thing. You know, we were talking earlier when we were when we were speaking about blood pact. How we have that uh, magic hour where we could play it mm -hmm. for a turn. Well, this kind of allows you to play it blood pact. <laughs> at will for two turns it seems mm -hmm. provided there's some not some card effect that you know forces the agenda to advance but uh yeah yeah, yeah that seems awesome. the main Ancient shades evils. of night are falling <laughs> it's twilight time yeah you could totally pull an ancient evils like right after you play this and that's True. like well it advances anyway <laughs> but yeah still this is that's i like it mm -hmm. uh so no investigator can be discussed without talking about their signature weakness. And this one is wacky, I think. <laughs> like everything else about Marie, this one oh, is wow. wacky. Oh, Marie. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the Baron. Uh, did you want to read this one, Nick? Sure. Um, one moment while I 
get it to where I can read the text a little more readily. All right, <laughs> Baron, is it? Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go. To is it some Samidi? Samidi? Sure. All right, uh, Lord of the Cemetery. Lord of um, the Cemetery. <laughs> That's what I want to be lord of so as, at some point. Yeah, right. As I understand it, he is he is a, an integral part of uh, voodoo folklore. Mm. Yeah. Um, so he That's is a <laughs> weakness <laughs> with the trait avatar. Intriguing. Um, mm-hmm. Asset, no cost. Revelation, put Baron Samedi into play. He cannot leave play while he has less than three doom on him. Forced. When any amount of damage is placed on an investigator in Baron Samidi's location, place one additional damage on that investigator. And then, free triggered action, exhaust Baron Samidi, place one doom on Baron Samidi. If he has three or more doom on him, discard it. Yeah. Hmm. Ouch. Yeah. (laughs) Oh man, that's super ouch. Yeah. Um, well. Oddly enough, I played him a lot in GoldenEye multiplayer <laughs> because Jeez. I had that ass. I had that asshole friend who always took odd job. There's oh, always God. someone who yeah, took odd, odd job. job. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's always yeah. freaking odd job guy. Um, I liked his hat. <laughs> so also, I didn't I didn't uh, note this when I was reading the card, but I just noticed he also takes up your ally slot. Yeah, so he'll boot in any ally you might have around. Yeah, yeah. So oh, pretty rough. God, if so everything rough. else wasn't bad enough. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like seriously, this guy says, like Revelation, whatever, put him into play. He also says, discard your current ally or yeah. a, a current ally if you happen to have, yeah, yep. whatever that uh, Charlie Kane permanent was. <laughs> Influence. Uh, charisma. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. God, so rough. So now we and need a he's card. Gonna... I was just gonna say now we need a card that will allow you to ready an ally or ready an exhausted card so that you can <laughs> pop more than one doom on him in a turn because otherwise he's eaten up three turns. Oof. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, like not only that, but he's he's adding doom to the board. Like you think yeah. Agnes's Agnes's weakness is bad? That adds one doom and takes up a couple of resources in an action. Mm-hmm. Fine. If you get this guy at the wrong moment, this this is pretty rough. But the nice thing is you can kind of play around him. So if like you you anticipate that people are going to be taking damage in a certain location, mm-hmm. Marie can just move elsewhere. Get <laughs> get out. Yeah. But the only positive he has is because you control him. He counts as a card he control. He actually activates Marie's ability, which is mm. something, not much, but <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I kind of feel like I would be tempted just to just to deal with the extra damage and just hope that you're not getting damage done to Marie along the way, versus trying to play get three doom on him and you know something goes wrong and the agenda advances and you're at two doom on him and that doom gets wiped out oh, and you have to go God. back. And deal oh, I didn't worst. even think about that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, the worst. Yeah. Oh and- man, there's gonna be some really bad Baron stories. I feel. <laughs> and and she only has six total health, so like that's she doesn't have a lot of room for error as far as when it comes to taking that damage plus one from a lot of enemies. So that's yeah, that's rough. Yeah, it's the I, I've only played one game with Marie so far, so sample size being what it is. But I do right. find her really interesting. Um, you know, the most remarkable thing to her actually is that she has four intellect. So you have a mystic investigator who can fight who really can well, invest- obviously, with the spells. But yep. she can investigate, you know, she's one You're of the best investigators Rex. now. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I-, I do like, because with she's introducing another aspect to kind of the the mystic game like uh with agnes you're you're playing the sanity balance the horror balance the whole game um and with marie you're playing this doom balance the whole time mm-hmm. and it's really tough to balance because you want the doom to be able to get her extra actions which is kind of the whole point of having her but at the same time you have to, you know, figure out the right times to try to, you know, sacrifice your arcane initiate to get the bo- doom off the board or whatever the case may be. So, right. it's a super interesting investigator. Mm-hmm. I will say that Baron Samidi is the first weakness to actually make me consider 
not drawing cards that often. So I probably won't <laughs> be playing Marie Lambeau anytime soon. <laughs> I I am fascinated by her and mm-hmm. my my main kind of thing I hung my hat on back in high school and college was was music and I was a singer. Uh so Jim was like, yeah, musician, awesome. But then they actually spoiled a, a singer. We could put together a band, a little, a little, a little uh-huh. mystic band. Like, are there, there's a, there's, there's a cello player, isn't there? Somewhere in the well, Arkham there's universe. The, there's the violinist. Patrice That's Hathaway. what I'm thinking of. Yeah. And Ashcan has a guitar, so. <laughs> Jeez, <laughs> also we could be- true. We could be a, a group of bards, basically, in the RPG. <laughs> oh, we're all playing bards. <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm fascinated by her. Yeah, Agnes mm-hmm. is just a straight up monster killer, and I love that about her. But I I'm very intrigued to try out Marie once. Obviously, I missed out on the pre order. Regret monster. <laughs> uh, but once she's actually released, well, here's a question um, regarding Marie. Um, after kind of brought something up in chat. Now, you know her passive ability says you can take an extra uh, action on spell stuff when you have um, one or more doom on the cards that you control. Now. If you have, if you trigger her elder sign effect, can you put a doom on any particular card you control? If you want to make use of her passive ability, that's or... how I read it. Okay, yeah, that's yeah it what seems it like it. I just like wanted it. to kind of double check with you guys. And no matter what, it's going to count toward the doom threshold. Sure, so that's absolutely. kind of what you're playing with. So yeah, yeah, that's okay. how I read it. Cool. Yeah. So put it on your knife right before you throw it at someone. Uh-huh. <laughs> mm-hmm. Nice. No, I mean, best card in the core I mean, set. Not. Maybe maybe knife isn't Doomed the, the knife. example I would use, but uh, you know maybe throw it on your leather coat right before you take damage. Oh wait, she could she could take survivor cards, right? We discovered that survivor mm-hmm. seeker. Yeah, she can wear she can wear mm-hmm. a leather coat. Yeah, so no, I think I think there's some fun strategy to where you put that doom when you draw an elder sign. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. That would give you a bit more control, which is key. One of the, one of the most uh, things I appreciate most about Maria is getting the free scrying use uh, each turn, uh, <laughs> because you can. Because yeah, sometimes the problem with scrying is finding the action to yeah, use all for times it. But, the problem but, with scrying, if yeah. there's ever a problem with scrying. That's but with the one. Maria, that's just the free scrying, and you get your the rest of your three actions. So, I think what we just determined is that the problem with scrying is that it's balanced, <laughs> and Marie gets around that balance. Like that's yeah, <laughs> that's pretty good. No, and so she you run She's face first into There's the Baron train. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, the Baron! Oh God, the Baron scares me. Yes, there are go- there are going to be stories where the Baron just wrecks people. I can't wait to be a part moment. of that story. Someone pulls a treachery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I will say again, I'm a little sad that the next purple card we saw was not Diana Stanley, but I'm still holding out hope. There are more purple <laughs> cards to come. We don't know for sure yet that we're not ever going to get investigators in Mythos packs, though. True. It is looking less and less likely, um, but I suppose it could happen. Never know. A boy can dream. <laughs> so is that it we had for... Wow, that, that was a sentence. Yeah. Is that all we had <laughs> for, for the news this episode? <laughs> yeah. Yep. I, I, guess, I guess the only other big thing of note was that uh, Team Covenant did a whole unboxing video of the mm-hmm. player cards of Dunwich Legacy with Matt Newman. So if you haven't seen that, I'm sure most people listening have, but if you I haven't, have you should check that it. out. I kind of don't oh, want to. Speaking, yeah, I I watched until they started getting to the cars, and I was like, eh, I'll bow, I'll bow out of this. <laughs> so thirty seconds, right? <laughs> the introductions I, I sat in. So speaking of YouTube channels, you should definitely go check out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, so last time we sat down to record the podcast, uh, it, I can't even remember what set us off, but we ended up deciding to Twitch and Tom. Yes. Because he's Tom, just pulled a Twitch channel out of his ass in about thirty minutes. Because <laughs> that's the thing that Tom can do. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> and we now have a Twitch channel, so you should go follow us on Twitch. It's just Mythos Busters, as you'd expect. And we're going to be porting all of our Twitch plays over to YouTube, which we we now have a YouTube channel, which is just Mythos Busters. So we've got 
one video up at this point. There will be more to come, including those card reviews that we've mentioned. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've just got the the Mythos Busters run through of the gathering, which, which was I fun. thought went really well. <laughs> it did. Yeah, yeah. It was kind of a trial by fire for not only the Twitch channel but for the Octagon implementation itself because I yes. never tried <laughs> multiplayer on Octagon. And again, apologies for it taking so long to get out to the public, but we're getting close on a release version of that. Yeah, I was about to say, that's that's the first thing we should say when we start talking about the Octagon, is that it's not ready yet, don't ask. Um, <laughs> well, ask, but just, ask away, just, be, but prepared. Yeah, just, just when be, the, be prepared when the answer is not ready yet. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I think, aside from a few kind of quality of life features, it played really well nothing broke the game yeah, we didn't get right. any crushing errors that we had to play around i agree so anyway mm-hmm. go subscribe to our youtube channel you'll see more content coming out in the future once january hits oh my god i'm gonna have so much energy for actual <laughs> gaming again <laughs> oh hey, go i'll be, be a whole person yeah that sounds like we are also uh looking to at some point continue our campaign playthrough of the course set uh yes. from what we started that first episode so that should be fun. It will be fun. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. It was cool to get all of it because you know it's it's. I talked to all of you guys separately, but it's it's only it seems to be only when we record do we all actually talk. So <laughs> it's good times. So guys, uh, now that we're through the wall of news, let's move on <laughs> to our lore discussion. Which you know I don't I don't know when people were kind of asking us to talk about lore, kind of what their expectations are. I Hopefully, think we, we've kind of laid it out. Well, yeah, <laughs> I think I think we all laid it out front that none of us claim to be lore experts, and in fact, some of us claim to not really know much about the lore and not really have any intentions to get into the lore too far. Um, but we have all played other Arkham games. I think uh, we have we've to. all read other Arkham <laughs> stories or Lovecraft stories in in varying degrees. So let's talk about uh, let's talk about Lovecraft lore a little bit. So so kind of breaking out into the actual discussion, I feel like one of the big attractions to to Lovecraft is just how distinct the personality of the mythos is. Um. At this point, as far as stories go, I've only actually read Lovecraft proper, but as I understand it, the mythos at you know at large is is pretty well defined still with that personality. So, what are your guys' favorite kind of mythos stories and and elements of those stories that you feel like kind of really define Lovecraft? Ian, do you have any any ones that are just like yeah, that's that's it? For me <laughs> oh yeah um well uh the ones that stand out to me are the dreams in the witch house <laughs> brown jenkins oh, for the God. No. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't start we have to start the conversation with freaking brown jenkins don't we <laughs> <laughs> yes we do let's, let's start the podcast over let's try this again <laughs> i quit <laughs> Dream, dreams of brown jenkins <laughs> oh, that sounds like a, a lovecraft um, story Oh my yeah. god! So I I only read Dreams in the Witch House about two three months ago, <laughs> and I'm always the last person to go to bed in my house. I'm just a perpetual night owl. That sounds familiar. So I'm always I'm always the one to let the dog out. It's always dark when I go to bed. Ooh, ooh, ooh. So I'm in the middle of reading Dreams in the Witch House, and I'm a really slow reader. So it took me probably a week to read it. <laughs> and I'm 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 going about my business at at night, and I'm I'm a little freaked out because you know, I'll I'll fully admit. Even as an adult, I run up the stairs a little bit faster when there's darkness behind me. <laughs> just a little bit. Just just a little bit. And uh, so I'm upstairs, I'm, I'm getting my stuff ready for bed, and I, I turn off the lights, and I'm in between the bathroom and the bedroom. And all of a sudden, something furry brushes up against my leg. Like, I've owned a dog for three years. I, in my, in my non-lizard brain, I know it's my freaking dog. <laughs> <laughs> but in that moment, I almost shat myself. It's like, oh yeah, it's Brown Jacket. <laughs> <laughs> brown Jacket is here. <laughs> so, right, so for Ian, those who you don't asked know, for that tangent, just by the way, 
<laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> For those who have no idea what the hell we're talking about with who Brown Jenkins is, the gist of the story is basically uh, this main character going to stay in the room where back in the day, supposedly this witch who was supposed to stand trial and escape stayed and managed to escape stayed in that room. And as he goes to sleep, he keeps having these freaky visions of uh a witch and her little familiar pal who's like a rat with a human face named brown jenkin <laughs> so i'm really looking forward to getting a brown jenkin card in the game one day <laughs> that would be great um but the reason i like that one is i don't know personally i find the kind of more intimate like haunted house like everyday type settings in lovecraft to be the ones i'm really kind of drawn to um, and it just has that aspect of, um, you know, touching on the weirdness of kind of that, that the stuff that's just under the cover of like everyday life. Um, another one that I really like is the color out of space. Is that the name mm. of the title? Hopefully mm -hmm. I'm getting that right. Um, color yeah, with the color a U. Out of, yeah. The color with a U out of space. The color, color out, out of space. Um, and there, and there's just the kind of the visuals in that story. Um, and I don't know, it's hard to kind of encapsulate exactly what makes it Lovecraft other than just this the idea of like, creepiness. <laughs> yeah. That it just slowly builds up. I, I guess what it does, what he does is kind of starts off with kind of this, this sense of like mystery, what's happening and you're slowly building to, kind of the eventual reveal of what the heck is going on. And it's usually pretty creepy. <laughs> yeah. And I, um, as far as my, my delving into the actual Lovecraft mythos, uh, Arkham Horror, the board game, was my absolute first introduction to the mythos at all. Like, I'd always heard of this thing called Cthulhu, and I, I could probably point it out in a, in a lineup of ten monsters. But uh, when I first started actually reading stories, it was via there's there's like these collections of uh, graphic novels of the the Arkham Horror mm. stories, or sorry, not Arkham Horror, Lovecraft Mythos stories, and the Color Out of Space one is <laughs> ridiculously creepy in that book because it uses a very cartoonish art style that starts kind of colorful and like everyone's got round faces and big eyes. And then, like, throughout the story where everything starts to slowly decay and corrupt and taint, like, the art style and even, like, the colors change to the point where it's, like, all grayed and smudged. And, like, by the time you get to the end of it, it's like, oh, my God, what am I looking at even? <laughs> and and just, like, I the they, they poured art craft into the art. Or, sorry, art craft. They, they poured <laughs> love craft into the art. Pointing new terms. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, that's where I was going, so why not? Uh, into that, into that graphic novel, and oh my god, it's it's so good. Let me see if I can Google image search a picture from one of the final pages. It's real bad, but yeah, that's that's also that's a staple. So, is there any other ones that just kind of grab you, Ian, or are those kind of your your top picks? I mean, those are kind of my top picks. There, there's definitely others that are, um, you know, I like the Dunwich Horror, which we'll talk about. Uh, I think in more detail a little bit later, just because it, it is kind of the, it seems almost the closest to the blueprint of like the Arkham Files games and mm. the Arkham Horror LCG, which we're playing. It seems closest to that. Um, so I appreciate it for that, for that reason. Um, I'm trying to think if there's the other ones that really jump out at me. Um, the music of Eric Zahn, because, you know, Sean was mentioning how music was a part of his life. Um, the same thing with me. And so uh, that's just a really simple story about this musician uh, upstairs from the from the main character who, you know, he just there's this weird guy upstairs who's playing this crazy violin music. Um, and so he goes up, you know, up to investigate and crazy things happen from there. Um, so a lot of these stories are just really simple kind of conceits to all of them, but they end up having a, a kind of a big effect for just some of these, like, I think what he was good at is kind of having these kind of visual images, uh, that really jump out at you, uh, for color out of space. I, I mean, I feel like I can spoil some of these stories cause like we said, I, they're public domain, so yeah, you should I have read them safe, by now, yeah. but 
<laughs> but there's the image in Keller Out of Space where uh, it talks about one of the characters who are, are getting affected by this strange color from out of space, <laughs> hence the title, and how they are just kind of crumbling to nothing. And that that mental image is just like gives you the shivers, I think. <laughs> Agreed. So much of Lovecraft just makes me crawl in my skin a little bit. <laughs> Oh man, they have this Lovecraft anthology on Kindle? I wouldn't recommend it because the colors in the uh, in the actual book are pretty awesome. But anyway, it's called the Lovecraft anthology. It was the one I was talking about earlier because a few people in the Discord were curious. Cool. Um, yeah, so it's got Call of Cthulhu, Haunter of the Dark, Dunwich Horror, Color Out of Space, Shadow Over Innsmouth, Rats in the Walls, and Dagon. All, all in that, that one kind of... It's like 15 bucks on Amazon right now. Worth every penny. Mm. Yeah, it looks sweet. They're short. They, they, you lose a lot of the detail because they are kind of like single issue stories, but God, the art is so on point in every one of them. <laughs> I, I also like uh, the Dream Quest of Unknown Cadith, Cadith, which is just totally different from most everything else I've read in Lovecraft. That one is next on my to read list. I'm I'm fascinated by everything I've heard about it. I've heard it's like Lovecraft does Wizard of Oz. <laughs> yeah, that's not a bad description of it. Yeah, but uh, that definitely fits. Uh, Nick, how about you? Anything, anything that just kind of encapsulates Lovecraft in in your mind, or at least the the feel or the style of it? Well, the very first story that I read by Lovecraft was Call of Cthulhu, and that was um, literally after playing Arkham Horror the board game a couple times. It's just grab my Kindle and find an anthology on there, get that, and read Call of Cthulhu. Um, just devour it in one night. So that that's kind of like the Lovecraft story to me, simply because that's how I first got into it. And also because Cthulhu is arguably the most popular um, piece of Lovecraft's work. I mean, he's everywhere. Uh, so, I mean, that, yes, but really, as far as his stories in general, I really, there's two kinds that I really gravitate towards. One of them is the idea that the world isn't entirely explored or that there are pockets and corners of the planet that that contain things beyond what we can imagine. Um, and I know it's been mentioned in chat a couple times. I know I've said it before, but at the Mountains of Madness uh, is always one of my favorites because I'm, mm. I'm, I'm not what you would call outdoorsy. I'm an indoor kind of guy. <laughs> So to me, Indeed. the scariest thing is, or not the scariest, but one of the scariest things to me is being far removed from civilization. Um, and at the Mountains of Madness takes place in Antarctica. Uh, and that's that immediate, like that premise right there is like that gets me like anxious, like that puts my anxiety up. And then everything else that follows that, um, the surgical descriptions of the <laughs> of the. Uh, aliens in exhaustive detail aside um is we're talking was, about like taxonomy level oh my descriptions. <laughs> it's uh no it's it's really it that one really really hit me um and it's one of his longer ones too which i really like but but other than that other than the ones that that like kind of explore these pockets of of um of wilderness or or extreme distances from modern civilization uh, i i really like the ones that posit the idea that Lovecraft's world or that these these strange experiences lie just on the edge of reality or just on the edge of what we know, and that literally just by peeling back a certain corner of of our perception, we can see uh, what's really there. Stories like Whisper in Darkness uh, was one mm. that really affected me um, because that's like that it's it's so the experience of the protagonist in that is so just like quote unquote normal. Like there's nothing inherently like supernatural in it until the revelation at the end. Um, and I love that. I absolutely And even love then it. it's still like grounded in what we would consider the rules of reality. Right. Exactly. Yep. And then uh, um, another one that I really like simply because of this, this concept of again, a guy in a strange land is a uh, shadow over Innsmouth which you mentioned um that I, I just that one to me seems like perfect 
gaming material. And I know that <laughs> the the PC and Xbox 360 game, Call of Cthulhu Dark Corners of the Earth, uh, took kind of like started with Shadow Over Innsmouth, like its first couple levels are that. And then, sorry, yes, thank you, uh, uh, Casey in the chat corrected me. Classic Xbox, not Xbox 360. But anyway, it started with Innsmouth and then it progressed OG further into other... Xbox. OG, yeah, Xbox OG, yep, definitely. Uh, so, like, that, to me, Innsmouth is this great, like, pool of inspiration for gaming material, because it's, again, it's, you're in a, you're in a town where pretty much everyone in the town is involved in this crazy, you know, cult stuff, um, but they have to keep this facade going, and you're the one who's poking around and asking questions where you shouldn't be, so that's, it's just rife with potential. Um, so those three are... Did I say three? Yeah, those three are my three big ones. But of course, I love Color Out of Space. Um, Rats in the Walls is a really good one. Uh, but yeah, oftentimes when people ask me my top three or my favorite ones. And then uh, also, real quick too, I know I'm kind of going on, but um, the chat mentioned King in Yellow, which I was only tangentially aware of what the King in Yellow was about. Uh, and then I watched season one of True Detective which references the King in Yellow and Carcosa a lot. And since then, I've done more research as far as... I haven't actually read the book yet, which I want to. But again, that plays with that idea that this supernatural horror is just on the edge of reality. And and that's exactly... That's like totally up my alley. So I'm very excited to read King, King in Yellow at some point. Yeah, awesome. I really like Innsmouth as well. That was one I forgot to mention. And it's funny because when I was going back to read it, a lot of these stories I'd read a long time ago back in high school, but I'm kind of reading them as they're new because I have no memory of them. But on the surface, Innsmith sounds like it could be kind of uh, kind of corny, like, oh, fish people, you know, how, <laughs> how <laughs> right. engaging can it be? But I was really stunned by uh, how much I like that one just because of the atmosphere that's built up. Like you said, it's this whole town. And I guess that's one of the things that goes through Lovecraft's works is like this idea of there's something going on that's lo you know long before our time uh, that's we're way out of our league and <laughs> you know there's there's not much we can do to combat it other than to run away or whatnot. Um, and I won't spoil it for anyone who's read not read that one but i love the twist at the end of that one it's <laughs> <Yeah>. so good <laughs> yeah I, I i guess it's it just plays into this whole idea of like there's there's so much out there that we don't know about and in lovecraft's versions of the things it's like we don't want to know about it because yeah. once we know about it we'll realize how screwed we are <laughs> well and and also to talk about shadows over insmith again real quick there there's a there's one moment in that story that sticks in my mind, um, and and it's like the is it when yeah. they're trying to break into the hotel room. It's yes, it's the chase oh. through the hotel room, and it's him <laughs> locking the doors behind him and hearing them, you know, break. Oh my god! Like it's so like I was I was gripping that book with white knuckles. Um, and after reading Call of Cthulhu, and then I think Shadows Over Innsmouth was my second one. I actually went out and bought a hardcover collection of all published fiction from H.P. Lovecraft and and uh like that's that that scene and that story Shadows Over Innsmouth is what sold me on on Lovecraft. Call of Cthulhu brought me in, Shadow Over Innsmouth cemented that. So. And if you've got a, a you know an underlying phobia of home invasion, maybe maybe <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Tom, I know you're a little bit, at least you profess to be a little bit more of a lightweight on the lore side. Have you gotten around to reading any, uh, any actual Lovecraft or? You no, know, I, I uh, can't say that I have. I'm a bit out of my depth here, not having read any <laughs> of the stories yet. So, uh, if you recommend a good starter or at least a one to start out with, I'll take it under consideration. Call of Cthulhu. Done. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So then, uh, I guess for my part. Nick Nick has covered a lot of what I would have covered anyway. Uh, I've really only read the staples at this point, kind of the ones that people say are the pillars of the you know the Lovecraft mythos. Um, so Call of Cthulhu for sure. Start a great place to start because it's 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 Cthulhu, right? I mean, there's no more the one and only recognizable uh, Lovecraft creation in popular culture. 
The one thing I will say is, is, and we're not going to get too far into the weeds in this one, but I will kind of lightly brush it. If you guys want to add anything, go ahead. I was not warned of the blatant racism. <laughs> and when I read <laughs> Call of Cthulhu the first time, it took me completely aback. The the first time I and when he I think it's the, when he really gets into it is when he's down at the docks and starts talking about like maybe some of the workers that are down there or, or something. Mm. I I like kind of I was breezing through the sentences and as, as I got onto the next page I'm like wait what did he just call that guy <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> back 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 so um, that's an entirely different discussion but right. just if you're listening to us and you too have not gotten too far into the mythos. Just be warned that there is uh, there is some of that in there, and it can be jarring, so so keep an eye out for it. Don't be surprised like I was. Anything to add, you two? I know we don't want to get too deep into the weeds on that, but I just, <laughs> I just wanted to I just wanted to put the fair warning out there if we're pushing anyone to these stories, what they should oh, expect. Yeah. No, that's that's a valid that's a valid point to bring up. Um, pay attention to which version of Rats in the Walls you end up reading, because there's two different versions, and they both, uh, the, the name of the cat, particularly, <laughs> changes from one to the other, and it's, uh... Does it really? That'll get you, too. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so anyway. I, I can't. I can't really do justice to that discussion now. Right, I feel right. like, but, but yeah, I always had a conflicted relationship with Lovecraft because you know, being a person of oh, color wow. myself and like reading that in high school, I was just like, what the hell, man? <laughs> you know, like, but but at the same time, like, there is so much about that world and the stories that attracted me. So, you know, uh, obviously, it's something I've had to deal with with other writers. But yeah, I think it's just something to be aware of like you said and kind of go into it with eyes open Mm -hmm. that yeah that that is my goal just open eyes yep Yep. um interpretation (laughs) we'll leave for another episode if we ever have the guts to take that one i'm okay if we don't that's not that's not our (laughs) podcast style (laughs) um so so anyway uh call of cthulhu great place to start uh i i love the scene where they finally stumble upon relia and and kind of it's interesting how Lovecraft kind of uses he he not only talks about things that are so weird or obscure or terrifying that they're unknowable, but also in his language, he invokes you as the reader to fill in the blanks that he intentionally leaves. So he will basically set up scenes or describe things as this thing or that thing, and in your head, you've got to fill in the blanks. And I imagine most people who are reading novels like this are probably have a pretty you know active imagination it, it's kind of cool to to just be like oh what what is what is cyclopean architecture really <laughs> and and kind of fill in those blanks um so you know discovering really for the first time was kind of cool and i think that to me kind of defines that part of the style of, of lovecraft because there are times like nick mentioned where he goes into like forensic detail describing the anatomy of the elder things Mm. and then in the next sentence he'll be like oh and the monster was so unknowably terrible it boggled the imagination it's like (laughs) pick a lane yeah um so call of cthulhu is awesome mountains of madness honestly was the one that gripped me the hardest Mm. uh i've enjoyed every one that i've read that's not saying much because i like most things but um, Mountains of Madness being a huge fan of the thing and just yes. kind of the idea of this this place that is supposedly desolate and supposedly cut off and in, in Mountains of Madness, you know, pretty much at that point untreaded or undis- uh, unexplored, probably less so than it was in the thing. Although, I don't know, how much have we explored Antarctica at this point beyond satellites? Probably I still, haven't explored uh... it at all, so. <laughs> <laughs> Get on it, Nick. <laughs> anyway the the idea that something gets uncovered and I, I love the discovery element of it is when they when they go down into the city kind of the things that they find and the implications that they're able to glean the story mm-hmm. that's told in retrospect like it, it's almost to me like proto bioshock where you're not actually seeing the story unfold you're seeing you know the footprints of the story and you're right. you're piecing it together from there um so that that style I'm trying to think what else. And to me, I think we're, we're probably going to get to it in a little bit more, but the Dunwich horror 
is like consummate what I think of when I think of Lovecraft because my introduction was via the board games and that's kind of the thing where mm-hmm. it's like something happens and these normal people go out and try to solve that thing that's happening and it's in kind of Arkham ish at least in the general area yeah and uh, yeah that's another one that's I, a very I guess the other one premise. Mm-hmm. yeah. I guess the other one to check out if you're interested based on the game about ghouls because of the core set. There's so many ghouls around. Mm, um, yeah, Pikmin's model. They do show up in Dream Quest, but it's kind of a wonky take on ghouls. So Pikmin's model is interesting. Uh, a guy has an artist friend who's painting really weird <laughs> paintings, uh, and some of them include ghouls in them, and that's kind of one of the main windows into ghouls and Lovecraft. <laughs> There's a running theme in those paintings. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah I and... think uh, one of the cards, I can't remember which, I think one of the ghouls has the, like, eating a man's head like candy, something like that, which is from Pikmin's Yeah, like a model. child would eat at candy or something like yeah. that. <laughs> um, well, and what's funny is the, the implications in the settings of the paintings where the ghouls are right. is kind of the yeah. terrifying part where it's like, oh, shit, these things have been here the whole time. What? Yep. They were there? <laughs> no! It's kind of like Forrest Gump, but ghouls instead. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably the least likely way I would have described that. But somehow it makes sense. That's the best pitch. <laughs> you like Forrest Gump? Well, try this. <laughs> and uh yeah i suppose the other one i really have to throw a nod to even though it's 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 a disdainful nod was dreams in the witch house um, <laughs> it really is that it's probably the, the the best one that i've read so far of that kind of venturing into time and space unknown as it were oh, but freaking brown jenkin i really need to play a game in person with you sean because then i can bring my little ba- brown <laughs> jenkin model along. <laughs> canceling gen con hotel <laughs> that sounds frightening <laughs> um yeah and and you know that everything that's been mentioned so far i would i would agree with the, the staples i trying to remember what was the last one that i oh yeah yeah the dream quest of of Kedath or whatever it is is the next one on my to read list but the great thing about most of Lovecraft is most of his stories are super short so even a super slow reader like me can get through a fair few when you're motivated Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. so at least there's not that barrier when you talk to someone about Lord of the Rings or you know Game of Thrones or you know any number of the the big monolithic you know popular culture fiction works it's like oh I gotta read seven books (laughs) So, super approachable. They're all standalone. Episodic content before episodic content was a thing. So, okay. So, talking about then what elements we, we've enjoyed, we think are Lovecraftian. What are some things that you'd like to see in the card game that we haven't yet? Narrow off the you got any? Oh, okay. Nick, <laughs> what? what, what? <laughs> Isn't it? Wait, hang on. Isn't it? Oh God! I always do this. Nyarlathotep, Nyarathlothep, Hotep. Um, Hotep is to, the end. That's all I know. According to the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game by Chaosium Incorporated, they have a pronunciation guide in there for a lot of the major, um, a lot of the major characters. And according to that guide, it's Nyarlathotep. Um, okay. Assuming that I'm reading it right, which I could. I, I don't have it open in front of me right now, so. But. But um, yeah, I, and that uh, the only reason why I'm so on board for for now, now is, is he was is he, he the, uh, the the dude who shows up briefly in Dreams in the Witch House? Is that the dude who's kind of insinuated there, or is that that something completely separate? Yeah, I honestly don't remember. I haven't read that. That was one of the earlier ones that I read, and I don't remember the specifics. Um, but chat is confirming Gaffa, and chat is confirming that yes. Um, Oh, right, yeah. Um, a version or a mask of Nyarlathotep shows up in Dreams of the Witch House. But the reason why the, I'm... The black man, right? Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, but I loved, like, I think the first experience I had with that, with him, was in the Arkham Horror board game. And just reading the rules on just setting up the game for your first game, it's like, 
if this guy isn't your ancient one, don't put these monsters in the cup. I'm like, wait a minute, this guy gets his own monsters? Like, what? And then going through those and, like, reading about them. And then from there, it was uh, the old Call of Cthulhu RPG campaign, um, Masks of Nyarlathotep, and then someone eventually made a sequel to it called Sense the Sleight of Handman. Um, I haven't actually played those, but I have read them. And they're so, like, they're such, like, global um, stories that are set in Lovecraft and they deal with Nyarlathotep and the masks that it's it's such a cool concept and a cool, um, like, faceted story that I would love to see them do that in in Arkham Horror, the card game. And honestly, when I, when Carnival was spoiled in that article, with the release article, and I was reading that, and I just saw the... I didn't even read any of the cards. I just saw the trait mask. And I was like, oh, awesome! It's gonna be not a lot of It's gonna be him in Venice. That's gonna be so cool. And then I got it, and I'm like, well, this is still really cool, but it's not quite what I wanted. <laughs> I feel like Venice isn't really his, his hood, is it? No, nah, he's kind of all over the board, but no, yeah, not specifically. I mean, I suppose if he shows up in Arkham, but freaking everyone shows up in Arkham. That ain't no thing. <laughs> right, yeah. Ian, you got any uh, any wild hairs for for elements you want to see in the card game? Um, other than Brown Jenkin, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler alert for Dreams Dreams in the Witch House. Mercifully, get... Brown Jenkin dies at the end. <laughs> <laughs> so, if, if there's a if he? there's a merciful <laughs> god or gods. We will not see him in the card game. Um, but I guarantee I you that if Matt Newman is listening to this, he will give me Brown Jenkin before he gives me Diana Stanley. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe they'll show up at the same time. That'll be the price you pay. Um, I, I I guess in seriousness, I would like um, something along those lines. Like we had the, the house thing in the first scenario, the gathering. But I'd like to see at some point kind of like a haunted house type scenario where it's not so much fighting a bunch of ghouls, but maybe you're fighting some ghosts or whatnot or trying to figure out how to deal with them in a way that's going to be not just like straight ahead combat. Mm. That I would fully agree with. Uh, I enjoy interacting with monsters. I like how they're designed and how they feel different from other, you know, particularly Lord of the Rings or even Eldritch or, or proper Arkham Horror. I like how they're handled and how they interact. But I would like to see a little less enemy focus in, in certain scenarios. I'd love to see something that's not quite so combat heavy. Um, and I, I honestly hope we see a lot more of that because to me, Lovecraft there's monsters and they're important. But it's almost more about the internal struggle of the of the protagonist than it is about, you know, the the actual physical struggle of encountering monsters in most case. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I would definitely echo that. Any yeah, I, settings that uh, you, you you particularly want to see? Um. Hmm. I guess, you know, I'd want to see Egypt as yes. well. Um, really definitely, cool. that that would be something interesting. And um, I don't know. I, I definitely think we'll probably see Smith sometime soon. And I would like to, you know, because I like that story, I would like to see a whole campaign focused on uh, that. Yes. Uh, Thalassophobia trigger. <laughs> <laughs> So, Tom, I know, as we've mentioned, you're not quite as much into the back lore, but kind of what you've seen the game do, things that you're aware it's capable of via the other Arkham games, is there anything that you are hoping to see going forward? I mean, it's forward? hard to say. It's like you were talking about, you know, locales to visit, and from your discussion tonight, it seems like there's no shortage of places you can go with this. Um, and, yeah, it definitely makes me curious to read some of these stories, too kind of see some of that for myself. Um, but yeah, I mean, just on the surface, like, you know, uh, like you were mentioning a haunted house scenario that might focus more, a little bit more on the investigative side of things rather than pure combat. Um, I'm all about that sort of thing as well. And um, yeah, I think, do you guys ever play that? I never played it myself. There was a video game that came out somewhat recently. It was probably popular called Undertale, 
where you can actually oh. play through the game and not actually kill the enemies at all. And uh, like just the concept of that sounded really cool. So, you know, something along those lines that could be more investigative um, and just tweaking the game framework. I'm always excited to see what they do with that. And, you know, they've impressed me so far with everything they've done. So I'm, I'm just kind of uh, ready to see what's next. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much potential. There's so much potential energy. Mm -hmm. It's so tough not to get too hopeful with it. Um I can't remember Tom when we talked about like my my love of the mummy, which is one of the greatest action movies ever created. <laughs> oh, it's so good. <laughs> You're in that camp, right? Oh, okay, it's so good. Good. <laughs> good. Okay. <laughs> I, love I, the mummy. I am I cannot believe that Hollywood felt the need to remake it to right. reboot the mummy with fucking Tom Cruise. I like, mean, uh, I love Tom Cruise why? and I love action movies, but yeah, I don't see any reason that the mummy needed to be rebooted. So like, I'm, I get I'm that Brendan Fraser is kind of falling out of favor now, but like Brendan Fraser in the <laughs> in the late '90s, like I'm I am very confidently hetero, but I would think about it. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> wow, did you guys see the 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 trailer that was leaked for the new Mummy though, where the, it wasn't fully edited, so it was just random sound effects like. No. Tom Cruise shouting into the ether with no other no sound effects. No, no. <laughs> you, you have to check this out. Yeah. <laughs> you have to check this out. It's pretty great. Though. It's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So for my part, one of my greatest hopes, and I know they can't straight up copy it, but I would love to see them do something kind of in and around the mountains of madness. And it seems to be a, a favored setting for many Lovecraft fans. I remember when they announced the uh, the Mountains of Madness expansion for Eldritch at Gen Con. There was abrupt applause. So my my hope would be that we get something akin to the thing. I've been <laughs> thinking about it myself for custom content, but I'm not much of a game designer, so I haven't come up with any brilliant ideas. But I would love to see some way of building in a hidden trader mechanic to the game. Oh, and then setting it loose in kind of a desolate place like Antarctica. It wouldn't have to be Antarctica, but basically, if you give me the thing in Arkham Horror, like I'll drink the Kool Aid immediately afterward. I, I <laughs> oh, will yes. be forever an adherent. Matt mm -hmm. Newman, please. <laughs> if you could, and it wouldn't even have to be. I would imagine that would have to be something like a standalone scenario because how do you work that into a campaign? But, oh, God, I would so love that. And, of course, the mummy. Give me stuff in <laughs> Egypt, and I'll be a happy camper. With an investigator that's a Brendan Fraser lookalike, right? Or a Diana Stanley lookalike, either way. <laughs> I mean, I'm pretty yeah. sure the Eldritch Horror Mark Harrigan pretty much is Brendan Fraser from the mummy. <laughs> And as far as his ability goes, he's right there too. So, um, yeah. So, and kind of moving on from there. Talking about, I think most of the lore that we've talked about so far is actually proper Lovecraft. Lovecraft wrote it himself. Has a very distinct style, as we mentioned. Has some some drawbacks, some flaws. How would you consider? you know, actual Lovecraft versus the Arkham Files, which is the, I think it's the Chaosium property that, or I don't even know how the, the whole thing came about, but FFG has licensed, as I understand it, this kind of version of the Lovecraftian mythos from Chaosium and Arkham Horror, Eldritch Horror, Arkham Horror LCG, are all, uh, Elder Sign are all kind of built on that. What do you think are some of the main differences or main advantages, disadvantages of the Arkham Files over kind of classic Lovecraft? Um, from my experience with it, which is pretty much limited to just Arkham Horror, the board game, uh, Eldritch Horror, the board game, and Arkham Horror, the card game, and then uh, the core set of Call of Cthulhu, the LCG. Um, what I noticed pretty... Uh, pretty heavily with the Arkham file stuff is it's much pulpier um, than... Define pulpy. 
pulpy like the uh like it's actiony. Not not action like an action movie, but it's um a little more high concept. Well, Mr. Trench uh Casey in chat said that it is uh he says it's Indiana Jones, and that's kind of the feeling you get. Is that yeah, it's horror, but they're leaning less on the horror and more on the idea that like you may not succeed, but but you can do some cool stuff while you fail. Um, and that's kind of a how... little less desperate, a little less, a little right. less hopeless. Yeah, there's more dynamite, and more Tommy guns than what you would expect in like a Lovecraft or a cosmic horror story. Um, and I like that. Like I, I write. Like as a writer, I write kind of pulpier, and I gravitate towards those kind of stories. And as a gamer, that's fun. But at the same time. There's this certain feeling that I got the first time I set up Arkham Horror and I saw the city and the layout and I knew what I had to do. Or most recently, when we set up Carnival of Horrors and I saw, you know, all of the, the masked hmm. party goers throughout the city and I knew my movement was limited. And I knew that it's like, I got to investigate these party goers. I got to unmask them. And they could be villains. Like that's that's the closest that Arkham Files have gotten to kind of that, like I mentioned earlier, that that horror on the edge of reality. That that it's just beyond our perception. Like, and I love that feeling, but it always ends up turning into a pulpy, actiony, race against the clock sort of feel to it, which isn't bad. It's just that's not always what I want as an entitled game. That's, I mean, that, no, I think that's fair, uh, because as as a gamer, you kind of, and especially in a game like this or the RPG or whatever it happens to be, you kind of want to become the characters you're playing. You kind of mm. identify with them, and you want, you know, I think with Arkham, we're a little bit more willing to accept that failure is a more likely option, but you still want success to be an option. Oh right, and yeah. and kind of kind of putting it more in that actiony, heroy, maybe a little bit more cinematic feel kind of gets you there mm-hmm. yeah that, that's kind of where i'm at with it like it's definitely more pulpy like the the clear example is the one play mat where there's like two guys in a car and they're shooting a machine gun at <laughs> tentacles like <laughs> like that's pulpy um but it makes uh, for one hell of a play mat i have said that's my that favorite play mat <laughs> and, and it's like um i guess the biggest difference is just that thing of like in arkham files you can succeed in defeating the this crazy cosmic horror that's coming in and lovecraft stories that was rarely the case outside of the dunwich horror mm. um but for me that works like in, in a game like the you know there's a big part of me that just wants to grab a shotgun and blow a monster's face off you know and, and get enjoyment from that um whereas in the fiction and the stories i do want kind of that more like introspective creeping horror but i'm not sure if that can really be translated to a game form that well outside of like a true rpg so I, I think that division works and between the Arkham Files and, and Lovecraft stories. Um, I think with the way Arkham Horror LCG is set up that it has room to explore both ends of that spectrum. But if it ends up being more on the pulpy end, then I'm I'm kind of okay with that. And I think kind of both, both of what you were saying without actually saying it is, I think one of the big differences between the Arkham Files and actual Lovecraft proper it's just kind of a, a an acknowledgement of the media. So much like we would expect a book that we read to be different from the movie, although quite often superior. Uh, I mean, the medium kind of demands different things. Do we? And that's uh, that's honestly why I think there aren't many movies adapted from Lovecraft stories. Is that like if we take them wrote from the book, that doesn't translate to the screen very well in a lot of cases. Right. Right. So very similarly, kind of taking Lovecraft as it is, as he wrote it from the page, trying to translate that into a game where players are excited and engaged and they, they kind of see what's going on and they're 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 you know committed to, to what's happening. I you know, I, I'm totally okay with a little bit more of a, a cinematic, less hopeless pulpier is is the the popular term, I guess, feel. 
Yeah. Well, yeah. and and I don't know. I'm not much of a purist though, because you know, as it's been mentioned <laughs> yeah. multiple, multiple times, I came into the universe via the yeah. game, so that's kind of the baseline well, for me. Same, same for me too. And to FFG's credit and the Arkham Files credit, like my knee jerk reaction, like after Arkham Horror LCG came out, or not after it came out, but after it was announced and we had committed to this and. And before I had even seen anything about the first few scenarios or anything, I was thinking about what Lovecraft stories I would want to play through. And of course, the ones that we all mentioned here today, tonight, were the ones that came up. You know, Shadow Over Innsmouth and the Dunwich Horror and and that sort of thing. And then um, it wasn't until I think the Dunwich Legacy was, was announced or spoiled or whatever you want to say. But that was when I realized, like, you know, I wouldn't mind playing through the Lovecraft stories, but I've read the Lovecraft stories. And with FFG doing their own thing, doing, taking the mythos as a baseline, and then telling their own stories around the mythos, like, I'm alright with that too. Like, that, I think, is what I want over that. Like, as much as I love the Dunwich Horror, I'm much more excited to play through the fallout of that than I am to actually play that. Uh, so, I mean, they've done a great job with with taking what's been established in the mythos and doing their own thing with it, much as what they're doing uh, with Lord of the Rings currently and what they've done previously, moving around inside of the established lore. Um, but yeah, uh, it's it's just, like I said, it, it, it showed me that what I thought I wanted wasn't really what I want <laughs> in a weird way. Yeah, that's, I mean, however you see it. I think one of the other big things that, uh, obviously since we mentioned kind of the detriment in the the actual Lovecraft proper, the positive side on the Arkham Files is that it is much more inclusive of (laughs) people of color and women in general, it turns out. Mm -hmm. Uh, Three of the five investigators we get in the core set are women. And they're all the better ones, it turns out. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> only one can get the shotgun though and that's Roland <laughs> <laughs> um, so th- I mean that's a big advantage as well uh, it, it it gives a much more broader perspective people want to see themselves reflected in the games they play and if, if there wasn't a divergence from what Lovecraft wrote that would be pretty hard mm-hmm. <laughs> so definitely a positive end on the Arkham Files kind of take on the whole mythos so, last thing I kind of want to see is, I suppose let's talk Dunwich a little bit, but 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 before we get there, from the other Arkham Files games that you've played, or you know whatever it happens to be, are there any other investigators or or specific items or artifacts or any other like specific elements? Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> Did someone smack a coin down okay? on the table? <laughs> We're fine. Sorry is, about that. Is two, is two face in someone's house? That was Tom getting Tom angry about not having coming. anything to say. <laughs> are, uh, ooh, new pants needed. Um, are there any other elements of any other Arkham Files games that you guys like definitely want to see in the LCG in the future? Harvey Walters. I knew it. I just knew he was one of the. He was just one of the original uh, in uh, what was it, the Mansions of Madness, um, first edition of the board game that I remember playing. He was an investigator. He was an investigator. Excuse me. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So I'm excited uh, to do you, return what, what, him. That's all. Okay. And what's what's his deal? What's his backstory? What's I can't his even remember. It's subtitle. been so long. <laughs> <laughs> just his name just and his, his face. name. <laughs> Okay, Tom, you've played Eldritch though, right? Do you have a Do you have a favorite out of the Eldritch box? I don't. I've only played it once, so no. Okay, fair, fair. Sorry, right, Ian, go ahead. I was saying Rita as an investigator is top of my list. She is one I use often in Matches of Madness, and she's also in some of the novels as well. So hopefully, we'll get her sooner. You know, I was kind of confused by all the Rita love. When she was announced. And then I played Elder Sign. 
<laughs> dear God, if she's not the best investigator in that game. <laughs> she's so ridiculous. Um, yeah, and kind of knowing her backstory, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, but Ian, it's kind of cheating to pick something we know is already coming, so try again. <laughs> well, I mean... <laughs> You're right, but wrong. <laughs> Uh, Actual speculation, please. Let me see. Um, things I want to see from other games. Uh, I don't know. I, I like the fire in Mansions of Madness. So maybe <laughs> stuff will catch on fire. <laughs> I like it when we can burn things. I like when things catch on fire. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I... I you know, on a serious note, that's one of the things I do like in Mansions of Madness, and we've seen it a little bit in Arkham Horror LCG, is kind of the interacting with the environment of locations, like through the barricades, so anything that plays on that more, um, whether it's player cards or stuff that the encounter deck is throwing up. Environmental obstacles. <laughs> well, and yeah, that's, that's totally valid, because... The, this game is breaking, I think, new ground as far as what locations can be in a game like this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think, oh my god, damn it, <laughs> this is the first time, first time an actual image in Discord distracted Woo! me. Uh, Fire um, bad! <laughs> <laughs> oh, Phil Hartman will always get me. Mm -hmm. Um, What was I saying? Yes! Locations, awesome! I love what they've been doing them so f doing with them so far, and and I really hope to cons to see that continue in the future. Yeah, Sean. Now, is there an investigator you are looking forward to? <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Why don't you tell you know, us about it? There's there's a thing that's been happening. Uh, when I first opened the Dun or the the Elder Horror box, I was attracted to a, a very specific investigator. Uh, I, I couldn't tell you why it was, what happened. There was just this kind of a magic that that coalesced between us. Uh, oh I would I'd really be excited to see Silas Marsh in in the Elder Horror box. <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, we already kind of got him in the Overpower art. So mm -hmm. there's yeah. that at least. Um, no, but uh, honest to God, that was the first investigator that I kind of gravitated toward because he, I don't know. I don't know what it was about Silas. I like the fact that he could take on monsters. He was pretty well-rounded in everywhere except for lore in that game. Um, but of course, of course, once I actually learned the game and learned the world, I, I mean... Diana Stanley needs to be in the game, guys. It it just is it's, it's the thing that needs to happen. There are cultists everywhere. One of them has to be Diana, <laughs> waiting to recant. So now, Sean. Um, now we know that FFG and 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 Matt and Nate are um doing some pretty cool things with the lore, and they're kind of taking some liberties and having fun with it. Would you still play Diana? If her signature weakness was Brown Jank. Oh, <laughs> God. Oh. That, oh, that's Sophie's choice. <laughs> um, <laughs> Please make it happen. That'd be amazing. <laughs> yes, because because my, my love for Diana is undying, even, even if I had to put up with that little furry bastard. <laughs> Thankfully, I don't think it will be, but in, in this hypothetical world where weird things happen, yes. yes. They, they should make Brown Jenkins' times, card yes. textured so that you can feel oh. his hair and, little, <laughs> and the palms of his hands. The, the back of the card is it has like a layer of like fur on it. <laughs> and you always know where he is in the deck, so that just that right, sense yeah. of dread when he's like slowly rising to the top. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's just like a thing. hair larger than the other card, so you can just barely you can see like a corner <laughs> of it poking out. Um, the the other thing I'd really like to see is I think Eldritch does really well, especially with like the expedition space and and certain other events that happens. But finding within the game these really powerful items like the Sword of Saint Jerome or the Silver Key. Mm -hmm or the Mego brain case, or any of those really cool, powerful items. 
we're kind of getting that with the, the you know the side quests and and the different things that you can acquire with with actual encounter cards that you can start to include in your deck but i'd really like to like legitimately start seeing artifacts specifically powerful items that all of a sudden are now in your deck and this is a part of my character now i can just whip out the sword of saint jerome on any monster that wants to stand toe to toe to me and let them come. Yeah, I like that from a gaming aspect or from like a gaming standpoint. I like that. No, don't don't put your GM hat on it. We don't need that. Right <laughs> I now. like that from the again, the pulpy side of things. But when it comes down to it, when I think of Lovecraft, I don't like I don't want my character standing there with his longsword plus two. You know, I I'd, I'd rather have I'd rather Again, I think to me, the first time I really felt that that like sense of openness and dread was in scenario two of the core set and how it's like suddenly it's like there's here's the city. We got to look for stuff. Some of that stuff could be bad, but we got to do it. And there's a ticking clock the whole time. And then when the when the masked hunter comes out, like I just I want more of that kind of stuff. I want more of the investigation where you almost don't want to keep going, but you you have to. Um, and I'm I know that we're gonna get more of that. So, where you're just constantly glancing over at the resign card, exactly. Like, oh, like it's yeah. right there. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna tech in. I'm out of here to every deck, regardless of class. <sighs> you guys can't stop me. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. I mean. You're not playing rogue, so I'm not really worried about you randomly <laughs> playing. I'm out of here. That's what that card's called, right? Yep, yeah, that's literally what I just. Yeah, that was what I was referencing just a second ago <laughs> when I said I'm gonna tech. I'm out of here into every deck. <laughs> I swear I was listening to what you were saying. <laughs> um. <laughs> so Laura's side, obviously, the next one we have coming up on us is the Dunwich Horror. It's it's a consummate piece of the mythos. It's it's a cool story. So, oh God, I don't know. What do we want to say about Dunwich? Like the the story itself is awesome. There's this thing that happens. They call it the Dunwich Horror. And we're I guess coming up. How long does it say? Several months after have we have we learned how long we're coming in after that actual event? I think that first article mentioned, but I I don't have it in front of me. Yeah, I'm not sure. I do believe it's it's just a couple months. Um so that being said, those of us who have read the story, what what do you think the effect the Dunwich horror has had on Arkham and Dunwich and the surrounding area? I mean, do we think we're actually going to see I know we talked about it earlier, we're probably going to see nods to the story, but what do we think we're going to see? Hmm. That's <laughs> that's a really good question. That <laughs> apparently, I was not prepared for at all. Um, yeah, see, so I'm going the, into the, this the, as one of these investigators trying to find out what happened here. <laughs> <laughs> Coming in with fresh eyes. It's all too real for Tom. Yes. With fresh eyes. Um... I mean, okay, so Gaffa bring or sorry, Casey brings up in the in the, the chat here. And this was something that was in my mind simply because of the box art that's been spoiled. But do we think we're going to see another Dunwich horror? Did Wilbur have a third brother? I well, yeah. Or a second brother as numbers actually work? I think we're going to see some regardless of of family ties or anything like that. There's there's probably going to be some effort to recreate it or to do something similar. Um, I honestly don't know other than just saying that. And that's very broad, obviously, but <laughs> I, I can't even begin. I don't, I don't even want to begin to guess about the story just because it's so it's exciting to, to think about. All right. Well, what I'm hearing is maybe that the uh, the Dunwich lore episode is maybe a forthcoming one after we've seen the entire cycle and can talk about all the nods that came through. Mm. I think that's a safe bet. So, 
All right. Well, I think that was actually a pretty solid lore segment. I was kind of worried how that would go because I, <laughs> yeah, fully admitted, I'm a very lightweight in the Lovecraft lore section. But I honestly don't think Speak you need yourself, to know Sean. a whole lot. <laughs> no. You're a you're a featherweight, my friend. <laughs> We were all a little I, concerned that I this would be like a, a 45 minute episode. <laughs> well, yeah, no doubt. We're, we're cresting like two hours and a half here. Right. But I think it actually speaks to the strength of the game that you do not need to be a Lovecraft fan to enjoy the game. And I agree with that. Yes. The, the numbers on BGG would support that. The people that I've heard uh, express interest in it. My wife enjoys it and she has... <laughs> Like she would hate reading Lovecraft, yeah. just knowing what I know of of her, what she enjoys in reading, and kind of like what she goes for. But digs the game, so good on Matt and Nate for for creating a game that exists well within that world, but still at the same time is accessible. Because mm-hmm. I I don't know how easy that is, but it can't be great easy. <laughs> great, great, can't easy, be great easy. easy. Wow, let's let's wrap this up, late, guys. <laughs> this is what happens when I podcast two nights in a row. <laughs> so uh obviously if you have additional thoughts let us know in the comments on our uh our wordpress page message us directly on the facebook uh we'll definitely be revisiting lore probably at the end of every cycle because as i as i imagine the cycles will be referencing things that happen <laughs> or have happened in uh oh my god crazy quiche is not going to be the episode title i promise <laughs> guys let's uh let's cut this off before it gets too bad and move to tentacle time now i know ian had to jet unfortunately uh we, we got a little late for him this is our i think our latest recording time ever i'm going to regret it in the morning but i'm enjoying <laughs> myself now uh so tom i know you have been busy but have been off so what has been grabbing have oh my Ow! god yeah i'm not just even drinking over. what's Tom, happening i'll take over i'm not even drinking <laughs> oh uh yeah Tom, because i've had been some time you off, lately um i've been getting a little bit more back into video gaming which was uh you know my my love and passion but before board gaming hit the scene for me um and so i've actually been playing through mass effect trilogy again i know you would love to be here for, for this as well um as a fellow mm. mass effect nerd but just seeing some of the stuff for Andromeda coming out, it's got me really hyped. Oh, so yeah. I decided to to revisit the trilogy, as it were, and I've been streaming it on Twitch as well. Um, so I've been having a lot of fun with that. We've finished Mass Effect One. We are partway through Mass Effect Two, and uh, I look to be I look forward to be picking it back up. Um, hopefully, in the next couple of days, continue streaming. I've had a little bit of a break for the holidays since I've been away. And the other time sink that's been happening is I've gotten sucked back down the Destiny rabbit hole. Um, a game I have a love hate relationship with it with, but a few of my friends have gotten back into it lately, and I have jumped on board. And it is a great game, um, and I do love it to pieces. But uh, <laughs> I, you know, my 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 time with it comes and goes in waves, um, and it's certainly in full force at the moment. So, as someone who's not into shooters, mm-hmm. what what's the appeal of Destiny? It's a shooter. What what keeps you coming? Oh, okay. <laughs> that's a no. It's a good question. I mean, I do like the shooter aspect of it. I for first of all, I gotta say, I hate first person shooters on consoles. I'm more of a mouse and keyboard guy when it comes to shooters. Um, no, no, no. Do, so. do you remember what? Well, do you remember what I mean, you said, I don't want to say that with any sort of elitism. I mean, it's just <laughs> it's just my own personal preference. And I'm sorry if it came off <laughs> condescending. Um, no. But because I know you guys like in, in playing Overwatch on Tom, PS4. I don't know if you could be condescending if you tried. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly don't want to start any uh, fanboy wars here to each their own. Um, and so I still struggle with first person shooters on on console. And if Destiny were available on PC, I pro- you'd probably see me over there. Mm. However, the game is is absolutely gorgeous. I want to say the production value is is through the roof on that game. And what's well, the Halo team, right? The 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 original yeah, developer of and Halo. Like Halo is a, a series I, I never got into. Again, it partially could be because first person shooters on console never really interest me. So I don't know what drew me to Destiny, to be honest. Um, but it kind of you know it's 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 partially an Was MMO. It your density. Mm-hmm. I'll applaud you just for the Back to the Future reference, but no further. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, so yeah, I don't know what it is that drew me into Destiny. Um, it kind of had a Mass Effect type vibe to it a little bit. Mm, yeah. I don't know if that had an influence on me or not, but um, it's fun and you know it's fun to play with friends and it's got kind of some of the MMO trappings that I like with a little bit less of the grindiness that a lot of at least older MMOs tended to tended to have. There is some grindiness. You can make it as grindy as you want to in Destiny, but fortunately, playing through the main story missions, you can actually get through them pretty quick. So it's a, it's a game that I, I I applaud for being able to play kind of on your own time. So yeah, that's good. Mm-hmm. That's good. <sighs> what I mean it, has it just been Destiny for you? Anything else? Filling well, up that time. Well, like I said, Mass Effect. I mean, that's that's yeah. Yeah. Mass Effect, of course. Yeah, the Mass Effect streams, and yo, know, Coyote Moon, who I see in chat, he's been uh, he's been very patient with me coming back on the stream because it's been a couple weeks since <laughs> I've been streaming it. So hopefully, in the I next couple managed of days, to catch like five minutes of one because I had a little window. Where I'm like, oh, Tom's streaming. Yeah. Did you end up finding that uh, that Easter egg of Elcor Hamlet? Oh no, I don't think we found that yet. Because that is a thing. That is a thing. They reference it in Mass Effect 1, and then there's yes. actually, like, a preview for it in Mass Effect 2, and, like, I think it's one of the ad banners somewhere. It might be. You know, it's funny, because, like, I'm I'm relatively new to streaming games myself, and I find that, and this might be something that people get better with over time with streaming, but, you know, when I'm playing a game just on my own, I'll take all the time in the world to explore yes. every nook and cranny, but when I'm streaming it in front of an audience, it's like, okay, I gotta stay on task, I gotta get from <laughs> A to B, Keep mm-hmm. the people entertained, whatever, you know. So it's like I don't feel like I have the freedom per se to kind of just go off on some tangent Explore to find all the corners. Little, yeah, yeah. Um so you know, there's a pros to constant streaming. It's great to have an audience with you and kind of people can enjoy the story and, and what's going on, on the screen with you, and that's that's phenomenal. So I do I do uh like streaming it for that reason for those reasons. But like for example, when Andromeda comes out. When, um, uh, when do we have a release date for that? I don't yet? know if we have a release date It's yet. not tomorrow, so well, I'm a little okay. pissed. <laughs> Can't wait for that game. True. But yeah, it's like, I don't know if I'm going to stream Andromeda right out of the gate. For one reason, there's going to be plenty of other streamers doing that, so whatever. Um, but furthermore, it's like, my first experience with it, I kind of want to be able to kind of take it at my own pace and really yes, explore absolutely. everything that I want to. Um, You're entitled to that. Yeah. And so having played Mass Effect the trilogy before, it's it's nice that I'm able to kind of revisit this and freshen up my memory of everything and kind of play a character um because I was full Paragon my first playthrough because <laughs> I'm the goody two shoes and every in any RPG I like to play. But uh, you know, that's that's my first playthrough as well. I yeah. cannot fault you. And so it's kind of fun going back and playing No Renegades have more fun. <laughs> yeah, well so that's the thing. I'm not playing full Renegade for the sake of Renegade. I'm kind of taking taking the approach of um I think the I think the character I, I'm I'm modeling my shepherd after is um Admiral Kane from Battlestar Galactica, if you know that reference. <laughs> yep. But someone who like, you know, the means justify the ends, like yep. we're just gonna get shit done and you know, is a good guy, but you know, we're not gonna take any shit from anybody. Right. God, I love Western so, RPGs. It's been fun. Bioware is the best. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I did play through uh Dragon Age Inquisition. Oh, I haven't finished so that yet. How is the ending? That. I haven't even it picked good. it up yet. Yeah, a lot of fun. I, I've had that in my library since day one. Never got around to it, so I finally took Nick, the time. Nick, I'll finish it and let you borrow it. And <laughs> through it. it was great. <laughs> like, I, I'm pretty sure I'm 90% through the actual story, but then I just got, I got caught doing rabbit trails and catching all the side quests, and at that point, I kind of burnt out on the game, which was kind of stupid. I should have just finished it and then go back and do all the side quests. But yeah, it's super solid. Yeah, open world games. It's my favorite Dragon Age thus far. Open world games are always such a uh, like a. It's so like it's so easy for me to get into open world games, but then at the same time, um, like what was Oblivion, uh, the Elder Scrolls game that came out a few years ago. Like, I played that, and as soon as you get done with the introductory stuff and the world opens up, I just, I lost all interest. And I don't know what it was. So, it's yeah, like... I couldn't oh, get into those games myself. Yeah, like, Skyrim I did, but Oblivion, and, and Morrowind I did, the one before Oblivion, but for some reason, Oblivion just didn't interest me. Um, And I don't know exactly what it was, but, but yeah, open world games are always so hit or miss with me. I can never be sure mm-hmm. until I get past that introduction. So... But I, I look forward to eventually trying Inquisition. 
Yeah. 20 year old me loved open world games. <laughs> uh, 30 year old me played about five hours into Skyrim and was like, I can't right now. <laughs> so I'm going to do the werewolf quest and become a werewolf. And that's how I win the game. <laughs> yeah. Skyrim was this weird one where it's like, like I would run a couple quests. I'm like, okay, I got an hour and then I got to do, I got to get stuff done around the house. So I sit down, and I play Skyrim for an hour and I, I do some quests and I do this stuff. And then I look at my bag and I'm like, oh, I got all this extra junk in my bag. Let me go sell that. And I saw that. I'm like, oh, here's a new quest right here. I'll just run and turn this. Qu I'll finish this quest real quick because it's nearby. And then I'm doing that. I'm like, oh, I've never been in this cave before. And it's right here. So I'll just go. Into and next thing I know, it's like six hours later and the dishes are still piled up and laundry still needs to be done. And I'm still just playing Skyrim. So, yeah, that one that one stole some hours. From me. <laughs> Partway into your story, I was going to be like, Nick, what's it like to have willpower? And they're like, oh, oh no, <laughs> that's my experience as well. It's a little different now <laughs> that I actually have kids. But, yeah, before when it was just me in the apartment and like my chores are my own thing, like that was different. But, yeah, now. Yeah, when there's another being who would starve, but for your, <laughs> your intention, yeah. it makes the choice a little easier, it turns out. <laughs> Um. Okay. Cool. So, so Nick, what are, what have you been into in the last little bit? Um. Well, it's been a while since we recorded. Uh. Shortly after we recorded, my wife and I finished our co-op campaign of Arkham Horror. Uh. Her playing Agnes, me playing Roland. And by finish, I mean we got a not very far into scenario three before we just ended up losing. Um. I don't remember the details of how it ended, so I can't really uh talk about any of that because it has been a few weeks uh but i do remember that we were unsuccessful uh and then since then carnival of horrors came out obviously i played my first game of that with sean um at ffg which was a lot of fun uh also an unsuccessful game and then yeah <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, we're going to talk about that. <laughs> Wait. I still don't know why you swung at that boss enemy. Because I wanted with to. Because <laughs> I was. I think you just needed to go. Well, and then and then Caleb showed up and we sat and talked for another half hour. But um, no, it's just it was it was, you know, I'm not normally the kind of person to do the reckless thing. And I just thought I'm going to do it for once. Um, And then my wife and I, we played Carnival of Horrors as well. Uh, a few days after that, and that was like Sean, you and I got some momentum initially in that in that scenario, and we were able to to power through a little bit. My wife and I just like in as much as Sisyphus got momentum with the rock no, I think we did okay. For the, we you know we we did all right, but my wife and I we hit the wall like immediately. Like the first three oh. of the guests that we uncovered were all enemies, and we just got slaughtered. Um. And then, uh, so yeah, so that was fun. still a really fun scenario. I've only played it the two times, so I look forward to revisiting it and learning kind of all of its intricacies. Um, I want to get one of those masks in my deck. Like, that's what it comes down to. Uh, but, yes, yeah, so that'll be fun. Other than that, um, we, Sean and I and another group of people, uh, Brandon from the Cardboard of the Rings podcast, uh, some... Uh, local friends of mine who are gamer friends, and then also Justin, who listens to this podcast, and we've played some games of Lord of the Rings and Arkham with. Uh, we are all playing on Roll20.net, a tabletop RPG set in the Wars universe, which I have um, gushed about previously, so I won't spend much time talking about that setting. But it's a science fiction setting, and it's my first tabletop RPG game in a long time, and I'm we've only gotten the one session of it done well too if you count the character creation session but we've got two of them under our belt so far our next one is next week on mm -hmm. tuesday i am super excited because i love this setting i love tabletop rpgs and i love gming and seems like a great group of guys to play with i played with most of them before so that's been eating up most of my time <laughs> as it does mm -hmm. RPGs are a, a black hole of time and energy. They will they will suck up as much as you throw at them. Well, and when I was when I was laying the groundwork for this one, my whole thought was a year ago I had started a Wars tabletop RPG on Roll Twenty that didn't go anywhere. Like we did one session and that was it, and then it died just because people yeah, couldn't that, make that sputtered real quickly. Mm -hmm. So my thought was, um, 
that I'll use the same framework of the campaign that I had started, and that'll limit a lot of the prep time. And then it ended up turning into, well, I'm actually going to back the story up a little bit and maybe use this in a future set session. And then it turned into, well, I'm not going to use this at all. I'm going to do this totally new campaign and start from the ground up. Uh, but I, I don't regret it because I do I do love this setting. <laughs> and I love GMing and, and, and the world building and all that. So. so it's been a lot of fun so far. And again, we've only had two sessions. Yeah, it's a good time. Mm -hmm. It's a good time. Um, Sean, how about you? What are you been up to? <laughs> <laughs> I am actually super sad that Ian's not on because I just finished Westworld and mm. oh my god, what a ride! I haven't started it what? yet. It's good. You guys what? can't talk about it yet. What a ride! Holy cow! Um, the game, uh, the game, the the show endeavors to really be full of intrigue, a lot more cerebral than I think oh, uh, Game of Thrones. Sweet. Although it's kind of appealing to the same the same audience. I swear to God, Anthony Hopkins' character, and this is not really giving giving away much spoiler because he exudes this from the start. But I flip flopped on what side he was on <laughs> about six times throughout the series, and I still was not right. And God, that that performs. Anyway, the the show is amazing. Um, it starts out a little slow because it does have to set up the world, uh, but see it through to about episode three or four. If at that point it's not for you, then you're probably safe to to give it up. But oh my God, it's such a good show. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Uh, Rogue One. Rogue came out. Uh, yes. And it was goddamn amazing. See it at yes, some it point. Was. Um. You know, I it, I am very. Oh, you haven't seen it yet, Nick? No. Oh my god, dude! It's like I'm hoping must, that my wife and I can. A thing. I'm hoping that my wife and I can get to a movie this weekend. Um, mm -hmm. and but just like finding a babysitter for an eight month old, like yeah, we can tough. do it, but at the yeah, same time, the yeah, that's it. There's it's just like well, you know, it'd be easier if we just and we have so many movies that we haven't watched yet. There's Netflix. But at the same time, it's like, this is Star Wars. Like, And then, of course, I could get in. You must see it in the theater. Well, yeah, I know, I know you that. you tend to, but, but I, see, yeah. see that you do. <laughs> right, yeah. If if you need me to drive to Brainerd to watch Roland for a night, I will take that bullet. <laughs> I thought you were going to say to drag me to the theater and leave Laura at home with Roland, but your idea is a lot better. <laughs> um, no, yeah, I'm, I'm excited, and I do want to see Rogue One. My original thought was, is Arrival still in theaters? Because if it is, I might see that first just because we'll be leaving see soon. That too. Yeah, and it 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. Like, I've heard nothing but good things about Arrival. And both that and Star Wars are movies. No, no, no. We're talking about Rogue One right now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I stole your tentacle. I will hand it back. <laughs> yeah, I've seen it twice now. I The first you. time I saw it, I loved it. The second time was even better. Like, Arrival? It's, it's great. Uh, no, it's Rogue One. Oh, We're talking about Rogue One. Get on board. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm going to go again this weekend. Um, I'm very, very positive on on episode seven. I know a lot of people found it derivative mm -hmm. and and whatever, whatever the you know canned criticism of it is, because we have to hate things nowadays. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. um, I, it's pretty hard to poke holes in Rogue One as far as just like a cinematic movie experience. Real, real good. It uh, uh, we will yeah. probably table actual discussion for it till we next. We can talk season. about it later. Sure. Yeah, but we we got if you haven't go see it. It is so Star Wars. It is as it is as Star Wars as Star Wars has been since Star Wars was Star Wars. That's so interesting that you say it. that because I I hear yeah, from we, so many people that it's less of a Star Wars movie and more of a war movie. Well, then people don't understand the setting of Star Wars. I mean, if anybody's played, you know, uh, Edge of the Empire from you know FFG's role playing game of Star Wars, that's it's basically. Seems like a campaign right out of that. That or Age of Rebellion, Age. like mix those yeah, two Age of together. Rebellion, yeah. It's like characters from Edge of the Empire being brought into Age of Rebellion, and that's Rogue One, and it's great. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Anyway, well, I'm sure we'll talk about it more at length in the next episode, but go see it if you haven't. I finished Arkham Knight, so Batman fans rejoice. Uh, it was really good. It really played around with the idea that Batman's kind of slowly going insane throughout the 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 game and like crap appears and random game elements just morph mm -hmm. like there are there are times when an entire room will change so like you'll be in a room 
and something will will happen without you knowing it and you're looking in one direction and then when you look back the entire room behind you has just spontaneously evaporated without transition without loading screen it's just there and it's so crazy and it's so good i for some reason i didn't hop right on the arkham knight train because i heard so much about the uh the kind of release issues they had with the <laughs> version oh, and there it was, was kind of like it needed to be patched right away yes. and there was lots of drama was not great. involved there and it's kind of sad that the technical issues like that nowadays where game companies are like, no, we need to hold to release date. We can patch it when it's out, whatever. Uh, but the game itself is amazing. If you haven't played it yet, I would recommend that. This is to appease all the, the Arkham people who still came over to this podcast thinking it was a Batman podcast, right? <laughs> exactly. You can exactly. stop listening we gotta, now, we gotta guys. Throw it in every, <laughs> every once in a while, we got to throw that in. Um, got to throw a bat bone. And yeah. And then I also started Metal Gear Solid Five. Mm-hmm. Not very far in, cool. but enjoying it so far. Metal Gear in kind of an open world really intrigues me. I'm I'm interested to see how it goes. I'm kind of... Uh, it's superficial, but the fact that Snake has like weird shrapnel stuck in his head and has like a devil horn on one side. <laughs> I don't know why, just like that odd asymmetry bothers the shit out of me, but it totally does. Luckily, I only have to see him from the front when I twist the camera that way. Finish that game now so we can talk about the ending. <laughs> I'll work on yes. it. I uh, I took some days off after the new year, so mm. hopefully I'll be able to put a solid chunk into it. Okay. And then, of course, Overwatch, because Overwatch is oh, still yeah. Overwatch. Didn't talk about Overwatch. I've been Overwatching again. <laughs> yeah, well. Wish I could play with you guys. That'll just happen. Mm-hmm. The... Uh, yeah, you know, we would probably each pitch in 20 bucks you could play on PS4. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, although, although knowing Tom, time is more the obstacle than console. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure. Sombra's fun. But bringing things um, back to um, Arkham, Arkham Horror here, I actually did get uh, another thing that arrived today was a package from Draw Labs, which was the oh. coins Ooh. that you may or may not have heard earlier in this recording. Are those what knocked <laughs> over your microphone earlier? <laughs> Uh, yeah, and they're gorgeous, and I love them. And uh, I know we play with them when you for Arkham Knights because you had them, uh, Sean. And uh, so I was finally able to get my grubby little hands on a set, and I'm very happy. <laughs> what uh, did you just get the silver ones, or what? Well, did you it get seems a mix? like he's selling what, them as with? a pack now. I couldn't find a way to to oh, get yeah. like the individual coins I wanted, so I was kind Gen of Gen Con was a special sitch. Yeah, I was kind of forced to get the coin set. Um, which is enough, which is good. Yeah. I mean, they're solid. And in now, like in the moment at Gen Con, for some reason, I kind of balked at the gold ones and preferred the silver ones. I'm gold not ones so sure cool. of my decision at this point. The gold ones are pretty badass. They're pretty sweet. Though I do still think the silver ones have a more interesting elder sign. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the gold so. ones kind of look like the Hydra symbol from S.H.I.E.L.D. or something. Yeah. Hail <laughs> hey, Hydra. But yeah. All right. <laughs> And for anybody wondering, well, uh, why do you have coins for Arkham Horror? I, we use we've been using them as like action marker tokens. We flip it to just yes. denote how many actions we spent at a time. Not so much an issue in solo, I feel, but as I play mostly two handed with two investigators, it can help. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I'll just leave a game in the middle of a game and just leave it on the table. It's nice to have, <laughs> and they look beautiful on the table. So they do. That's <laughs> there's value just in that. All right, so I think that wraps it up for episode eight. Uh, like we've mentioned before, go out and follow us on Facebook. We've got the YouTubes. We've got the tweets. We've got our WordPress site. We've got Discord. We've got uh, a Twitch channel, if I haven't mentioned that already. That we do. Thrice, I think. <laughs> um, next episode, I think, based on our recording schedule, assuming everything falls in line, Everyone should look forward to a developer interview with Mr. Nate French and Mr. Matt Newman. <gasps> bum, bum, bum. It was promised and it shall come. I'm really looking forward to it. We're going to have some pizza. We're going to have maybe some beers. We're going to sit and talk game design and Arkham and, you know, whatever other random things happen to come up. Mm-hmm. Sounds and great. they will come up. Uh, so join us for that next time. Check out our YouTube channel, which will probably be the next content that we'll be producing. And as always, we will see you next time on Mythos Busters. Mm-hmm.